My name is Decker Fraser. I was a global brand manager for Sony PlayStation. I received my MBA in marketing from the number one ranked business school for marketing in the world, Philip Kotler's Kellogg School of Management. I taught marketing at the college level. I taught marketing for the Direct Marketing Association of Northern California. This video is a free preview of my course, which you can download in the link in the description. This course is on branding and brand management. Let's get started. We're gonna start this course with a case study on one of the world's single most successful brands, the luxury brand Lacoste. Now, I don't care if you're managing a business to business tech brand. I don't care if you're managing a brand that's for cheap consumer products. Whatever type of brand you're managing, you are going to learn something from the luxury brand Lacoste. One of the most important things that I want to highlight in this case study is that Lacoste is a French brand, a company that started in France, but its largest market is the United States. And the reason that they were able to become so successful so quickly in the United States has to do with some key learnings that we're going to take away in this case study having to do with successful brand management. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk through those examples and I want you to see how you can apply those learnings to whichever brand you're going to be managing. The first key lesson that Lacoste teaches us about brand management is the extreme importance of partnerships. Now specifically when we look at how Lacoste was able to grow so quickly, so successfully in the United States, a lot of it had to do with partnerships. But there are different types of partnerships. So the first that I want to talk about is key influencers. Key influencers are arguably the single cheapest way that you can acquire new customers because what you're doing is you're leveraging the credibility of people that already have trust with the target customers. You're also leveraging people that already have, in some cases, email lists, subscribers, fan bases, whatever media they're, they're in, they're gonna have access to a lot of customers that you're gonna want. So Lacoste does an excellent job of tapping into that as a, a more efficient way of driving influence with the people that they want to buy their product. So let's walk through some specific examples here of how they did that. Now, as Lacoste is expanding into the U.S., which is a much bigger market than France is, the focus is on influencers that are in the United States. And if we think about what the Lacoste brand stands for, it stands for two critical things. One is status, so kind of that luxury high-end feel, and the other is sport. So how do you achieve status in your brand. How, how do you make your brand represent status? Well, you give away your product to people that have status. And then what, by association, <clears throat> you uh, are perceived as something that's reflecting status. So if we think of the Lacoste brand, the crocodile, there's nothing inherently luxurious about a crocodile. A crocodile could stand for cheap, it could stand for expensive, it could stand for whatever you want it to stand for. But by associating it with people like President Eisenhower or John F. Kennedy, suddenly it starts to take on a different meaning. And the meaning is high status. So what they did is they, they gave away the Lacoste products to these two highly influential people. They also gave it away to people like Bing Crosby. So Bing Crosby, a famous musician and artist. So there's this aura of status that's around it. Now, what, what you may think is missing here is where, where is the sport element? Because a lot of the cost brand is also uh, in, embedded in the sports realm. And well, one of those, for example, is reflected in John F. Kennedy, who goes around playing tennis with a Lacoste polo. And then when the paparazzi or whoever takes a photo, oh, there's a little at, uh, crocodile on his shirt. So uh, Lacoste starts to build this, this brand position in people's minds of status and sports simultaneously. Now, the question for you when you're in brand management is, uh, well, that's great if you you can get access to the president of the United States, the most high status position arguably in the country, but more realistically, what are you supposed to do? Well, 
one thing that you can do is you can use this free tool called SparkToro. And what SparkToro will do is it will allow you to categorize who your customer is. So by who they talk about or what's in their profile, whatever. So maybe maybe your target customer's product managers. Well, you could change this drop down to um, has this word in their profile. And then you put in product managers. Hit discover now. And what you're going to see is a list of people, brands, websites, etc., that have influence already with your target customers. So then what you could do is you could do exactly what Lacoste did. Give away your product for free. Give away things that have your brand on them for free to those target influencers. And if they use it, if they're seen using it, you're going to have that aura effect of association and credibility that comes with influencer marketing. Now, we see a little bit of a different approach today with Lacoste. The type of influencers are changing to reflect uh, modern times and what Lacoste wants to be associated with. So a good example of this uh, would be with Bruno Mars. So we see a little more of kind of a hip vibe, a little more diversity, a little more on the kind of the fashion artistic space, a little less in kind of the preppy, old school, um, outdated feel. So that's how Lacoste is able to keep itself modern is by aligning itself with influencers that have some of that hip vibe. And you see this all the time in entertainment where uh, if you think about personal brands and entertainment, so musicians, You'll have somebody that perhaps is young, like a, a Justin Bieber, who, who kind of has this clean, fun feel initially when he was younger, but he needed some hip credibility uh, to kind of expand the user base or the, the, cusp, the fan base. Uh, so they, they would align Justin Bieber with rappers. So this is a, an excellent, easy way to gain access to new audiences by, by doing that kind of exposure. Now, we also see this with the cool co-branding with Ricky Regal. Um, it's not just Lacoste itself, but it's a whole sub-brand built around Bruno Mars. Now, the, the other key element here is the, the sports, the legacy that Lacoste has, and it is maintaining that. So whereas before we're looking at kind of John F. Kennedy playing tennis, uh, we're also seeing today with uh, Novak, one of the most successful tennis players in the world. This guy is a winner and Lacoste wants to be associated with winners. So here he is holding up a trophy and what do you know? He's got a little crocodile on a shirt. Uh, so th this Novak influencer is incredibly important. And when he, when he wins a, a tennis tournament, he gets a lot of publicity. And in turn, there's kind of this reverberation effect that happens with Lacoste where the brand is getting essentially free exposure, free recognition through the success by leveraging the success of uh, this famous tennis player. And if we look historically, the original influencer himself was actually the founder of Lacoste, Rennie Lacoste, international tennis champion. So this whole brand was kind of built around him putting a crocodile on his shirt. And this is one of the things that you, you need to think about in terms of brand management is that there's nothing, your brand, your brand name, your logo can stand for anything, but it's what you associate it with that gives it life, that gives it vitality. Associating it with this successful person, with that successful person, with this cool artist, with uh, this president, these are the things where people start to say, okay, this crocodile, this represents hip, it represents luxury, it represents sport, and it's through the influencers that you achieve that. One of the single most important reasons that you want to partner with key influencers is because it drives word of mouth. And word of mouth is one of the single easiest ways to get publicity and to acquire new customers. Now, if you're marketing a very expensive product, let's say $100,000 business to business software, you can afford some very expensive customer acquisition techniques. So you could pay 
$100,000 to an account executive to cold call the CEOs of companies to try to get them to buy that software. But when you're dealing with products that maybe are only $100, like a Lacoste Polo, it's not very cost effective to do that type of marketing because you have very little margin for error with acquisition. And the second somebody returns the product or maybe there's a defect or something, you're, you're suddenly not profitable on uh, that purchase. So the key with key influencers is that they help drive word of mouth as an acquisition channel and as a, as a way to get people to buy more of your product. Now, if we look at McKinsey and Company, which is the, the world's most prestigious management consultancy, they have an article where they analyze word of mouth. And essentially, they talk about three key components. Now, I'm, I'm going to talk about the three types of word of mouth briefly right now. We're just going to focus on one of them. Uh, and later on in the course, I, I'd like to get back to more details about these and uh, the role that Lacoste plays. So the first is experiential. So experiential is basically somebody uses the product and it deviates from their expectations, hopefully in a good way. So then they talk about it. Oh, this product is way more than I thought, or it lasted 20 years, and I, I thought it would only last a month or something. Uh, consequential is when companies will do things like creative advertising campaigns that are designed to stimulate word of mouth. So it's not just buy, buy, buy our brand, but instead it's more like, oh, we're going to have a silly gorilla in our ad, or we're going to have some... Uh, ridiculous surprise at the end of the advertisement. So that's kind of like forcing word of mouth through paid advertising. But the one that I'm particularly interested in here in terms of uh, word of mouth and key influencers is intentional word of mouth. And let's just see what McKinsey has to say about this. A less common form of word of mouth is intentional. For example, when marketer use, marketers use celebrity endorsements, so celebrities are essentially influencers, to trigger positive buzz for product launches. Few companies invest in generating intentional word of mouth. Okay, so that's interesting. This, this may be an underutilized uh, channel for you, partly because its effects are difficult to measure. Now, this is one thing that you need to think about with brand management is that often there is a fixation with things that are easy to measure, things where you can quantitatively say, we did this and got this result. But what we see in, in brand management a lot of the time is that the things that have the biggest impact are also the things that are most difficult to measure. And often those are things that are offline and happening through, through actual speaking. Um, so that's something you need to think about in brand management is let's invest in things that are not necessarily easy to measure uh, from an ROI perspective or just from a pure uh, how do we attribute leads or sales to what we did. All right, so be, partly because its effects are difficult to measure and because many marketers are unsure if they can successfully execute intentional word of mouth campaigns. So word of mouth campaigns based on key influencers is kind of a, a difficult space to navigate for a lot of marketers because they're used to measuring everything. And uh, what, what I would recommend is that you, you set a budget aside to experiment with this. Uh, I've done this before where I've hired uh, a, a few dozen key influencers to broadcast videos of a brand that I was trying to market. And then uh, I was able to see the impact after that. And it was, it was tremendous. The ROI was far higher than I would have gotten from, or what I had been getting from things like Google advertisement advertisements, which were much easier to measure, but impact was much smaller. Now, the other thing uh, I want to highlight is that the, the idea of a key influencer is a, uh, uh, it, the definition, there's no common definition for what an influencer is. Some people just think of it as people on Instagram that are talking about fashion, bloggers and stuff. For me, an influencer is basically uh, whoever has a lot of influence among the target customers. So that could be the president of association. It could be somebody on Instagram. It could be a blogger. It could be a vlogger. It could be an academic professor. Uh, if you're trying to influence lawyers, it could be like a, a law school dean, something like that. So I, I have a very broad definition of what an influencer is. Now, if we look at some of McKinsey's data, we see that the way that they're thinking about influencers is not necessarily just sort of these celebrities, but it's also just people that consumers know and trust. So let's talk about um, 
what this kind of broad market influencer definition looks like. So what they're saying is that about 8 to 10% of consumers are what we call influentials, whose common factor is trust and competence. So those are the key things there. If you want people to um, buy your brand, then you want to market through people that have trust and have competence. So for example, with Lacoste being associated with tennis, uh, Novak has a lot of credibility in the tennis space because he's competent in that space. Influentials typically generate three times more word of mouth messages than non-influentials do. Okay, so th this is proving that when you invest in influencers, the, um, the payoff is much bigger. And each message has four times more impact. So when people hear from an, an influencer, the, uh, there's a much bigger impact, recognition, credibility, weight added to that message. Uh, on Specifically on a re recipient's purchasing decision. So if a famous tennis player says, oh, buy this, uh, let's say, Nike uh, product, then uh, of course you're going to put more weight on what he says versus some random person you meet on the street <clears throat> or a friend of yours that just does not play tennis at all. About 1% of these people are digital influentials. Okay, so this is something I need to highlight is that there is a obsession among modern marketers that... Um, Digital is, is kind of the only thing that exists because digital things are easy to measure, but we see that only 1% uh, of these people are actually digital influentials. So a lot of successful brand management does not necessarily rely on digital channels. It's going to rely on uh, things that are happening offline. And often those are just conversations happening at the dinner table, etc. Most notably, bloggers. Uh, so when we're just talking specifically about digital influentials, uh, often they're uh, bloggers and they have disproportionate power. So key takeaway here is using key influencers to drive word of mouth because word of mouth is an extremely, extremely cost-effective way of, of doing marketing and customer acquisition. I talked about how one of the keys to Lacoste's success was partnerships with key influencers. We're looking at athletes, we're looking at musicians, politicians, etc. But arguably what was even more important for Lacoste's success, particularly when it first started to enter the U.S., was brand collaboration. So actually collaborating with other companies that manage their own brands. And the most important of these is with eyes on. So one of the reasons that Lacoste was able to establish itself in the United States so bloody quickly was because they partnered with Izod and they started selling all their products with co-branding. And you can see here uh, that Izod and Lacoste were kind of melded together in a lot of uh, a lot of fabric materials that went out there. So. There's a mistake that a lot of people think with brand management is they establish a new brand and they kind of think, okay, we need to do everything from scratch. And everything from scratch from a brand management perspective means investing tons and tons of money in brand awareness campaigns, which most businesses uh, can't really afford to do because there's huge economies of scale that are built over time by doing that. And often establishing a brand takes decades. If we think about some of the research from uh, the B2B Institute, for example, from LinkedIn, they're talking about that it, it does, it takes decades to establish a true brand. But there are hacks, and one of those hacks is just to partner with a company. So Izod already had itself established in the United States. It already knew how to distribute uh, these fabrics, but what it wanted was a little more uh, prestige from the Lacoste brand. And what Lacoste wanted was brand awareness in the United States. So it partnered with Izod, and th that's one of the keys to their quick success. Now, today they're forming different types of brand collaborations. And one of the most important that I found interesting was with National Geographic. So something that look I see Lacoste doing, and I, I've never worked at Lacoste, so I don't know what's happening behind the scenes, but I, I think there's kind of this reputation that it has as kind of being old and stuffy and preppy and outdated. So what they're doing is they're investing in brand collaborations that help make it seem hip, cutting edge, fashion forward. And we see that with their collaboration with National Geographic, where they have the Lacoste models acting like almost animals in the forest with leopard skins and with um, the, these cool uh, 
animals that their skin is being applied to the traditional crocodile. Uh, we also see a larger logos that are more prominent, more dramatic fabrics, things like this. Now, I don't necessarily think that the typical Lacoste customer is going to buy a leopard skin polo, but that's not the point. The point is the brand perception. Is it kind of cutting edge? So even if only, say, 1 in 20 uh, Lacoste people customers actually buy the product, it helps position the brand appropriately as not being outdated, as being fashion forward, as being cutting edge. So let's think about why Lacoste form a partnership with the National Geographic brand. You know, why, why them? Why not? Why not something else? Why not Discovery Channel or something like that? So I just quickly did a Google search here. Now, I, I don't know if this is true, but let's just assume that it is. And it says the target group for National Geographic is men between 30 and 50 years with high education and high income. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think of Lacoste, that's typically what I think of. Uh, basically, middle-aged men that are on kind of high-status people. They read about space, history, technology, nature, and psychology. So nature... Uh, very much aligned with what National Graphic is selling and much else. The potential to find interesting stories, news, and fun facts on topics like these are virtually boundless. Okay, so when we think about this group, it's not it's not a super narrow niche, right? Lacoste basically has stores in every major city. So we're not talking about just CEOs of X types of companies. It's not a hyper niche, but uh, it's... It's also not super broad. We're not talking about people that shop at Gap, for instance. So what we're talking about is kind of these middle-aged, high-income people. Uh, so th there's very much an overlap here between the National Geographic brand and the Lacoste brand. Now, the other thing that is important to highlight about this particular group is they tend to travel a lot. Now, travel a lot can mean for business, but it can also mean for pleasure. So these are people that perhaps actually go to Africa uh, for safari adventures, for example, which is very much kind of a National Geographic uh, type of thing. Now, the other thing, if we think about this group, is um, they're going to be in airports a lot. And in airports a lot, what are you going to do? Well, you probably are going to read magazines. One of those magazines might be National Geographic. Um, but the other thing is that you often see Lacoste stores in airports. So I, I see this all the time where uh, I may not see a Lacoste anywhere in a city, but then the second I get to the airport and leave uh, that, that city, that country, uh, I'm going to see a Lacoste shop. So they're hitting this group and they're simultaneously hitting them with the, the brain collaboration with National Geographic, which, which I think is a absolutely brilliant play. And it also plays into something we're going to talk about later where Lacoste is leveraging the, the feel-good uh, message of uh, catering to endangered species. Another brand collaboration that Lacoste has is with Polaroid. So Polaroid is a retro brand, all right? So these were cameras that were popular in the 1980s. But what we're seeing now is that the 1980s is cool again. The 1990s is cool again. This is what's in fashion with things like Stranger Things, a huge hit on Netflix. So what Lacoste is able to do is tap into this cool, what is cool? What is retro? Um, and they did that by collaborating with Polaroid. So no longer is Lacoste being perceived just as kind of this stuffy, formal, preppy golf type uh, fabric, but it's also being associated with things like fun, colorful, multicolored Polaroid imagery, which, which you see in the Polaroid branding, um, and you also see just in the photography. And you can see here that Lacoste is using these kind of retro 1970s things, which is uh, interesting because if you think about when Lacoste really became popular, it was uh, uh, in the, the 70s and 80s when that preppy look was uh, very popular. So Lacoste is able to maintain its its relevance, its coolness, its freshness, its appeal to younger people that are kind of growing into the, the target group for Lacoste that can afford it through collaborating with a, a very established brand like Polaroid, which is a, has incredible brand awareness. So let's take a look here because Lacoste has very much been focusing on collaborations as a, a brand management 
strategy. So if we look at what some of these are, uh, we have some brands that I'm not familiar with, but I think are kind of like cool designers, very fashion forward in, in countries like Japan. So National Geographic, we have concepts here. So this is not your typical um, <clears throat> Lacoste yeah, design style that you, the preppy kind of style you used to see, but by collaborating with concepts, they're able to enter that space with credibility. We have Croc series, which is kind of cool. Uh, we see the crocodile kind of being being more in a, a hip kind of street sense. Winter icons, Golf La Fleur. We have Lacoste Live, which is a sub brand collaborating with Opening Ceremony. We have Supreme to give uh, Lacoste more like a skateboarder or street appeal. Lacoste and Disney, so fun and, and cool, uh, not just your standard crocodile anymore, and not just your standard tiny crocodile anymore. Keith Herring, Lesage. Now, I, I don't know a lot of these brands, but um, I imagine they all kind of fit this kind of premium, somewhat high status or, or cool uh, persona. Lacoste and Visionaire. We also see, okay, Lacoste Fashion Show where they're collaborating with other designers. Um, yeah, so very cool very efficient way for Lacoste to expand their marketing through brand collaborations. One of the key things that I want you to learn from Lacoste is that you need to treat your brand as something separate from your product. And I think the reason that a lot of brand marketers get confused about this is because of the four P's. A lot of marketers use the four P's. And what you'll notice is there's no B in there. It's just product. So brand kind of fits into the product space, but it also kind of fits into the promotion space. And this is one of the reasons that I don't use the four P's. I use what I was taught at the Kellogg School of Management, which is widely regarded as one of the top brand management schools in the world. And what I was taught was the seven T's. And the seven T's has um, has brand as one of the key elements of the marketing mix, and it's separate from the product itself. So when we're thinking about brand management, we need to think about how the brand itself creates value over and above the product. And the example I want to give here is Zara. So I these are two brands that I like to purchase. I purchase Zara and I purchase Lacoste. Now for Zara, I'm not buying because of the brand. All the brand signals to me is I'm going to get great fashion at a good price and it's going to be very fashion forward, but I'm not actually buying the Zara brand. I don't care about the Zara logo. I don't want people to know I'm, I'm wearing Zara. It's not really part of my identity. I, I don't have a lot of attachment to the brand itself. So I buy Zara because the products are good. And by good, it means the cut is good, the fashion's great, it, it's gonna be kind of cutting edge, but I'm not buying for the brand. Whereas when I buy Lacoste, I can buy something incredibly simple. So just a very basic sweatshirt that an oral person might wear to the gym, a very basic t-shirt that's just black, but really what I'm paying for is the, the brand. And often, in a lot of cases, that just means the logo. So for example, here we have this basic green sweatshirt that has a very cool cutting edge crocodile metal icon on it. So in a lot of cases, I'm gonna pay a premium price to have that Lacoste logo uh, and that brand association and trust in the product. Whereas with Zara, I'm really just paying for the product. So this is something you need to think about when you're figuring out your brand strategy is you need to think about how is the brand creating value? And a lot of that is psychological and versus how is the product itself creating value, which is often more functional or more based on the technical way in which the product was produced. And you need to manage the brand as a separate entity from the individual products that you're stamping the brand onto. Another key lesson that we can learn from Lacoste is related to word of mouth, but it has nothing to do with key influencers. Now, earlier I talked about McKinsey and the types of word of mouth that McKinsey discusses. One of those is intentional. Intentional relies on things like key influencers, celebrity endorsements, etc. The other one that I mentioned was experiential. So is your experience using the product 
deviating from what your expectations were and you're likely to talk about it in that case. But the one that I want to highlight right now is called consequential. And let's take a deeper look at this. So marketing activities can trigger word of mouth. The most common is what we call consequential word of mouth, which occurs when consumers directly exposed to traditional marketing campaigns, pass on messages about them or brands they publicize. Here, here's the most important part. The impact of those messages on consumers is often stronger than the direct effect of the advertisements because marketing campaigns that trigger positive word of mouth have comparatively higher campaign reach and influence. Marketers need to consider both the direct and the pass on effects of word of mouth when determining the message and media mix that maximizes the return on their investments. So <clears throat> this is one of the biggest differences between somebody who is a, a, a mid-level marketing expert and an advanced marketing expert. Now, often what I see with mid-level marketing experts is they become very good at something called direct response marketing. And the way that a direct response marketer looks at an advertisement is, does it get somebody to act immediately? Does it get somebody to buy immediately? when you're dealing with business to consumer or become a lead when you're talking about business to business. The problem is that that mindset of direct response marketing doesn't scale very well when you're dealing with large campaigns, when you're dealing with economies of scale, when you're dealing with low value customers, low value contract. What you need is something that has a bigger cascade effect. And the way that companies get around this is they come up with very creative uh, campaigns that are shocking, are, are capable of generating a lot of word of mouth. And the way that they generate that word of mouth is not just through the people that watch the TV campaigns, etc., but it's through the PR. And often you see this all the time with things like uh, putting an advertisement in the Super Bowl. Is, is the direct return on investment from the Super Bowl ad really worth it? Probably not. What's worth it, though, is the PR and the publicity, the people talking about the ads. That's where the true return on investment is. So it's like dropping a stone into a pond. The stone has an impact, but it's really the reverberation. It's the waves that happen. That's how you're getting uh, a positive return on investment. Now, it's actually very difficult because creating word of mouth campaigns is not easy. It requires a lot of creativity. It requires a bit of a gamble. It requires risk taking. Uh, so often when a, um, a somewhat experienced marketing manager analyzes a campaign and they're like, they'll criticize it and be like, oh, that's just silly. You know, why is there a talking animal? Uh, why are they using humor? Why don't they just get to the point? Why don't they create ads that are more like infomercials, like buy now? This is the reason. The reason is the word of mouth. You are, as a brand manager, you're banking on word of mouth to make it worthwhile to do that. So if we look at the way that Lacoste has done it, is they're leveraging a particular aspect of word of mouth, which is the feel good message. And we're seeing this increasingly as a trend now in brand management, where companies want to align their brand with a feel good message, something like the environment, something like uh, or sustainability, protecting animals, because if you get that, you're going to have this sort of positive buzz around your brand and you're going to get tons of publicity because uh, you have more publishable content when you're doing something good for the world. Now, Lacoste, what they did was they replaced their crocodile logo with 10 endangered species. Now, here's something I, I want you to think about. I've I've never seen these in the stores, okay? I, I go to Lacoste all the time. I've never seen the endangered species. So I don't, I really don't think it has anything to do with actually selling these products, okay? I don't think they want people to buy these. It's more just a publicity stunt, basically. <clears throat> it's kind of saying Lacoste cares about endangered species. We're going to do this dramatic thing to our logo. You know, maybe they only did it for... 200 polos. I, I'm really not sure on the specifics of it, but the point is we're creating a story around the Lacoste brand. Lacoste brand stands for feel good protecting endangered species. Now we see this also with companies like Oreo. Oreo will come up with these dramatic flavors for Oreos. Like, you know, it's the Christmas Oreo or it's this crazy pink one, maybe a black pink Oreo. Now, does Oreo really expect to generate a lot of sales from these dramatic new flavors? No. 
Really what they want is just the publicity effect. So when Oreo comes up with these dramatic new new brands and flavors, what it does is it has a positive effect on selling the normal Oreo because you're creating more brand awareness. You're you're reminding people of how cool and cutting and, and how cool Oreo is. And that's what Lacoste is doing here. Replacing their logos with endangered species is helping sell the the original polo, which just has the the crocodile on it. Now, personally, I'd like to have one of these. I think it's a cool idea, but I can't get a hold of it. So they're able to raise awareness in this way. Now, there are lots of brands that do this sort of approach. And in fact, there are lots of brands whose entire identity has been built around that feel good message. So for example, Tom's Shoes. I think when they started, they had something where when you buy a pair of shoes, we donate a pair of shoes to some poor kids or something. I don't know the details, but we see a lot of companies coming out of nowhere with these brands that are built around a feel good message. And that's particularly effective today, and it continues to be effective even with brands that have been around for a while, such as Lacoste. Another key lesson that I want you to learn from Lacoste is that your visual brand identity is more than just your logo. Now, a lot of people, when they talk about brands, they'll say your brand is not your logo. And that's true. There's a huge strategic element to branding. There's a huge a psychological element to branding. And we're going to talk about all those in using frameworks and using kind of high level strategic planning. But right now I'm, I'm just focusing on this case study and I want to give you very specific examples. And one thing that I do want to highlight is that these little tactical elements, these little visual things are incredibly important in branding. And I, I don't want you to get lost in this philosophy that branding is all about high level strategy and positioning. There is the nitty gritty where the rubber hits the road is things like visual identity. So if we look at the example here, we have a modified version of the Lacoste crocodile that uh, is has been kind of overlaid with a zebra to to fit with this collaboration with National Geographic. Now, the way that a standard brand would approach this is they would just put that logo on the T-shirt. You know, it's just a basic T-shirt and they would say, OK, mission accomplished. It's, it's, it's a Lacoste product. It's a Nike product, whatever. But Lacoste isn't satisfied with just doing that. Instead, they do something else very subtle, but that has a huge impact in terms of separating Lacoste from other brands. And that is that they almost always put something on the back. It's very easy to just slap a logo on the front of a shirt. But Lacoste always wants to go a little bit above expectations. So they put this little subtle yellow, National Geographic yellow on the back instead of just the logo on the front. And you'll see they do this consistently. And consistency is uh, one of the keys to successful brand positioning. Now we look at another example. We have this collaboration with Polaroid. And they have these cool multicolored shirts. And for most brands and most brand managers, they might say, well, we created a multicolored shirt. It's got yellow. It's got green. It's got blue. We put our logo on it. OK, good enough. No, Lacoste is never satisfied with just doing that. Instead, what they do is they also add a subtle logo to the back, the Polaroid logo. And that adds that little extra special thing that says, hey, you know what? This is not just any brand that we're buying here. We're buying something that has an added effort. Uh, uh, kind of the going beyond expectations. And if we look at this example, Lacoste with their more modern sub brand called Lacoste Live, a more youthful brand, they are coming out with these very basic sweatshirts, the kind of sweatshirts from, you know, the Rocky era, 1980s, very, very simple, just cotton. Uh, but what do they do? They do a couple special things. One, they put a small Lacoste logo that is not their standard embroidery, it's actual metal. And uh, for most brand managers, OK, that's that's good enough. We did something cool. But no, Lacoste will always want to put something special on the back. And they use this embossed Lacoste logo. So it's the subtle little brand elements that you introduce throughout your products that are going to create this feeling that uh, I, I'm dealing with a real personality here. I'm dealing with something special. It's not just a logo that's been slapped on a commodity that I could have gotten anywhere. Lacoste does an excellent job of that. Let's consider some other sports brands. So for example, Nike. Nike, the brand, is really centered a lot on technical things. It's a technical brand. So for example, this pair of sneakers here 
there's a focus on zoom. Okay, the cushioning is important. The fact that there's air in the soles of the feet is important. It's also important when you're buying like hockey equipment from Nike. Is it going to perform well? Is it made out of the right carbon fiber? Are the materials going to enable me to uh, perform at a higher caliber? Now we look at Puma. Puma uh, repositioned their brand all around speed, which was a, a very strong strategic choice that uh, helped protect the brand when they deviated from that and tried to get more into uh, the fashion. It, it, it didn't work out so well. So look at this. We have Puma.com, forever faster. And we look down here, how do you push yourself by setting goals? For Puma, it's to be the fastest sports brand in the world. So here, a lot of the benefit has to do with functional benefits, outcomes like speed. But when we consider Lacoste, let's just take a look at their website. Lacoste is not a technical brand. The value that the Lacoste brand has is related more to identity, perception, psychology, status, luxury. Yes, there's an element of sports that goes into it when you're doing things like playing tennis or golf, but fundamentally Lacoste is not a technical brand. So when Lacoste starts to compete with Adidas and Nike in that technical space with their sub-brand, which is a Lacoste Sport, let's take a look here, it doesn't perform so well because you're competing with companies where it's like the material choice, the breathability and stuff. These elements of uh, brand perception and performance are more important. But where Lacoste excels has more to do with the, the psychological benefits, the non-tangible benefits. So you see even with their sports brand, okay, here with, with their... Uh, new releases, it's centered more around the, the French identity and the, and the design is more important than the functionality. So the takeaway I want you to have here is when you're managing your brand, you need to understand what the brand stands for, how the brand creates value. Is it actually signaling performance or functional benefits or technical benefits, or is it signaling kind of status, identity, originality, personality? And you need to take a look at in what space your brand is competing. So are you being associated with brands that perhaps are not uh, what you want to be associated with? So Lacoste, for example, being uh, competing with Nike, or are, are you competing with other brands that are actually in the psychological space that you want to participate in? The other key lesson here is that as you start to make mistakes in your brand management, you need to uh, recognize that, uh, let, set your ego aside and reposition the brand, go back to what your brand actually stands for uh, if you, you stem too far from uh, stretching the brand, for example, in the technical space. Branding is incredibly important, but often marketers overstate the importance of brands. First of all, brands are not competitive advantages. Competitive advantages generally come from two sources. Number one, economies of scale, and number two, customer captivity. Brands can help economies of scale and customer captivity, but they themselves are really just assets. And like other assets, they can be bought and sold. If a company wants to enter a particular market, it can simply purchase a brand that has credibility in that market. You can also invest in brands, as you would with any other asset, or let it atrophy. Think about Coca-Cola, one of the most successful companies in the world. A lot of people think its competitive advantage is the brand. In reality, Coke's above average profitability stems from its incredibly strong economies of scale and customer captivity. Customers are habituated to buying Coke for a number of reasons that include the brand, but also the taste, the addictive caffeine, and the fact that it's available everywhere. There are many companies that have failed and gone bankrupt despite having great brands. That's because brands themselves are not 
a competitive advantage. Brands are more important in some contexts than in others. Brands are less important in supply-driven markets. In other words, when you have a shortage of supply, demand matters less and branding matters less. What really matters is the supply chain. But if you have too much supply and not enough demand, branding becomes an essential tool to capture and retain scarce customers. Branding is a key part of the demand chain. Whether we're talking about business, marketing, or branding specifically, strategy basically boils down to two things. Where to play and how to win. For our purposes, where to play means the target market and how to win means the value proposition. One Typically trend the first that I really step in a marketing strategy is, companies is to identify or choose or the target market. their target customer. Usually when marketers talk rather about the than target just market, what the brand, they really mean is the target this customer. This really helps make your branding more customer centric. But I want you to Using imagine personalities like market, Bob the computer expert, a physical and Sally the entrepreneur helps you bring the much customer more than just metaphorically customers. Into the board. It's an entire ecosystem. These personas of buyers also give visibility to the marketing if department. If you only focus and on make customers, it easier to promote your you can agenda. run into problems. For example, but often these B &B personas are to focus not just when on they should be based on robust but also on quantifiable data. Otherwise, here is one of the, the most powerful ways to do segmentation would fall apart. You send out a ton of surveys asking questions about behavior In and motivations related to video your product. Games, Sometimes you I can need then to run a cluster families. analysis with a program Here, like the customer Stata is the or parent, SPSS. The person that actually Here you can the see purchase. that there are three distinct But I must groups also mark it to the kids. Who Once you've identified these segments, you can then find out if there are demographic data the target that market correlates is defined with each cluster. The five C's. Perhaps cluster the one customer, leans more towards males company, or older. Collaborators, you can then use that competitors, to form a persona and the context. One trend that I really the second part of a brand strategy is figuring out how a brand creates value in the target market. Not how the product creates value, but how the brand itself does. And once again, you cannot focus solely on the customer. Because value must also be created for you and for your collaborators. A brand that creates value only for customers is not sustainable. Here's an example where brands clearly create value. This shows how people perceive the taste of different beer. Note how varied the perceptions are for each product. But look what happens when the testers don't know which brands they are drinking. Little difference is perceived between the products. As you can see, the brand itself, independent of the product, enhances the drinking experience. Value is created for the customer and for the company and collaborators in the form of higher margins. Brands are only one way in which value is created for the customer. Below is the best framework I've ever seen that outlines exactly how brands create value for customers. This comes from the book Strategic Brand Management. Functional value is created when brands communicate what the product is, who created it, and what functional benefits can be expected. Functional value is also created when brands enhance the actual performance of the product. Take for example the beer study, wherein the taste perception was altered by the brand rather than by the product. Psychological value is created when brands create certain emotions when they become a means of self-expression, or when they make one feel like they're part of a greater cause. Monetary value is created when brands serve as a price signal, or when they enhance the market value of a product. One of the biggest mistakes I see, even among senior executives, is conflating the customer value proposition, the brand positioning, and campaign ideas. 
At the highest level of marketing strategy is the value proposition, which details the many ways in which you create value in the market. The customer value proposition is specifically how value is created for the customer. The brand is just one tool used to create value for the customer, but it creates value in many ways. Some of these are unique and some are not unique. Points of difference and points of parity are both parts of value creation. Brand positioning is choosing how you want the brand to be perceived psychologically, bearing in mind how competing brands are perceived. Positioning is usually based on just one or maybe a few attributes that distinguish the brand from the competition. So positioning is something you decide on after you understand the various ways in which you create value. The big idea is a campaign concept in which you focus your communications on one primary benefit. There was a lot of confusion about the four P's. Historically, these were considered the foundation of marketing, product, place, promotion, and price. But the four P's are really just the marketing mix. In other words, marketing tactics. And something you'll notice is that they don't include one of the most fundamental aspects of marketing, brands. Brands are a unique and powerful marketing tool, separate from the product and separate from the strategy. They are tactical assets that support the marketing strategy, but a brand can still have its own strategy. Because the world isn't static, brands need to move and adapt. Sometimes key customer changes force the brand to change. If your customer base is aging, it may be necessary to reposition the brand for younger people. If the company can no longer create superior value in a certain way, you'll need to align the marketing and branding with your competitive capability. Sometimes only small tactical changes are needed to stay current. The process for changing a brand should begin with assessing the strategy, i.e. the five C's that form the market and the value proposition, and then look at the tactics. Research can help a lot in assessing how customers perceive your brand. The most important part of brand design is consistency. The primary role of design is to communicate the value proposition to customers. To do this, brand design needs to be consistent with the strategy. The designs must also be internally consistent so that consumers don't get confused about what your brand stands for. You can control how people perceive your brand if you keep communicating the same thing over and over through design. But here is the hardest part of brand design. You can't just literally communicate the value proposition. You need to evoke an emotional response from people that makes them feel the value proposition. Design bridges the gap between strategy and psychology. One mistake with design is making the brand seem more expensive than competitors are. Sometimes brand design is about making your product look better and more expensive than the competition, but usually it's more about horizontal rather than vertical differentiation. It's not about showing that you're better, it's about showing that you are the perfect fit for a particular purpose. Often designers make the mistake of designing brands to be luxurious. This can turn off customers who receive the message that it's expensive or arrogant. Look at Dairy Queen. The brand looks fun and accessible, but it's actually more expensive than competitors who you would think were more expensive. Here are a few of the key characteristics of great brand design. Consistent with the strategy and with design. Scalable and versatile. You should be able to extend a brand beyond a single product and be able to use it across various media. This is important to achieve economies of scale in managing a portfolio. 
ownable and unique are you using color shapes and imagery that won't be associated with the competition memorable attractive and lastly emotional humans are emotional beings and relate to brands in emotional ways brand design is an incredibly creative and emotional process but don't forget that it can still be tested in highly analytical ways to see if it does evoke the desired response from customers. This is an example of a brand that I developed years ago. I'll use this to explain good use of brand design. I hired a very talented Russian artist to paint this iconic woman. I wanted a style that contrasted sharply with the clinical look of competing designs. Competing brands were oriented around negativity i.e. the problem, whereas I position this product around positivity, i.e. the solution. The woman is younger than the target for several reasons. Firstly, adults generally view themselves as looking younger than they actually do. Secondly, I wanted to evoke the sense of energy and vitality felt when you're young. This was a critical component of the value proposition, and I used design to evoke it emotionally. Look at the logo. Note the clear legibility on the typeface, since this is a new brand. I wanted the brand to be trustworthy, but not in an arrogant way. The boy achieves this, and so does the historic look of the logo. The natural ingredients in the cart reflect the natural ingredients in the product line. There's a general feel-good quality to the logo, with a sense of energy and movement. The gold foil along the edge communicates that the brand is about premium quality. The brown color says natural from the earth. The texturing in the white area also gives this natural earthy feel. The stamp gives the brand timeless credibility and reinforces the brand name. Note that I built scalability into the brand design. Here, orange signifies products that address arthritis. Green represents eye care. Note the binoculars for the eye care product and the movement of the bicycle for the arthritis product. The design is also versatile to work well in various media. Look how it transfers well to the bottle from the package. As a general rule, brand marks or logos get simpler over time. When a new brand is created, nobody knows it, so often brand managers rely on iconic imagery more than the brand name. As the brand builds equity and awareness, you can rely less on busy imagery. Look at how the Visa logo has changed over time, gradually removing the busyness in favor of what is effectively just a word mark or text. Have you ever noticed how differently companies approach the branding of sequels? Look at Star Wars. Almost every movie is branded with Roman numerals, making it clear that all the movies are related. Video games sometimes follow the similar pattern. But then there are other products that don't have numbers at all, and are branded by themselves. These tactical differences are very important because they reflect the underlying brand strategy. When you use SQL numbers, you can alienate new customers. They might be intimidated by Star Wars 19, thinking that they need to have watched all the early movies to get any value out of the latest one. Star Wars Rogue One, on the other hand, seems like something you can jump into without any background experience. One of the hardest parts of branding is bridging the gap between what the value proposition is factually and how people understand it emotionally. Sounds are often a direct emotional trigger for people that bypasses normal analytical thinking. Have you ever heard a song that could instantly move you emotionally and bring tears to your eyes? Sounds are a direct connection to the soul, if you will. One of the main benefits of brand sounds is memorability. When I was growing up, 
my town had this pizza place called Greco. I never forgot the phone number because it was recited over and over in my head as this jingle, 3103030 Greco. Another key benefit is amplification. People have an odd willingness to recite brand jingles, even years beyond when the advertising for them has stopped. Here is a good empirically supported framework for understanding how brand elements like jingles can go viral and contagious. As with design, one of the key challenges with naming is evoking the value proposition emotionally. Literally writing the word premium may not make people feel that the product is premium. Be careful when looking to large companies for inspiration. They often use abbreviations and acronyms, not because they are ideal, but because it's difficult to abandon the history behind the name. There are lots of considerations in choosing a name. If the name is common, take for example the word simple, you may need a lot of resources to make it ownable. Do you have the resources to dominate search results for the word simple? What about the legal resources to protect the name? Are you going to be able to spend enough on advertising so that people associate that word with your company? Success with naming comes down to alignment with the strategy. Does the name help create value for customers, the company, and your collaborators? Or does it fade into obscurity? Your motto is customer facing, so it's all about creating value for the customer. Once you've laid out exactly how the brand creates value for the customer, you can start to narrow in on one or several aspects in which your brand creates superior value. Remember, customers don't care what you offer if your competitors offer the same thing. Value is always relative. Always keep emotions in mind when writing a motto. Emotions are actually a stronger predictor of higher sales than our demographics. If you can establish that direct link between the words on the page and the emotions in someone's heart, you've succeeded in communicating value. Remember what I said at the beginning of this course, brands are assets. And like other assets, they can appreciate in value or depreciate. In other words, the brand equity can change. As you accumulate brand equity, you can apply your brand to a new product. This is called a brand extension. Brand extensions make sense because you can leverage the value of a brand to enhance the success of a new product. The key consideration is value. Will customers value the new product more now that it's associated with a certain brand? This might sound obvious, but you'd be surprised at how Fortune 500 companies can actually destroy value with using the wrong brand. Brand extensions have their trade-offs. For example, if your new product is cheaper, that price perception could damage the brand equity. If your new product is vastly different, consumers might get confused about what your brand stands for. You need to consider trade-offs in doing brand extensions. If the new market is growing quickly and is strategically important, then you may need to sacrifice equity in the old market. Brand architecture is about structuring a portfolio of brands. The decision to have multiple brands, or just one, is a brand architecture decision. 
One of the key challenges is achieving management efficiencies. You might find that having a niche brand for every subcategory creates value for customers, but it may be inefficient from the company's perspective. That's why a large company might divest itself of brands that aren't worth a billion dollars. This way, a brand manager can invest millions in brand awareness campaigns, concentrate efforts on big brands, and achieve economies of scale. Generally, companies with diverse target customers will have multiple brands. By diverse here, I don't necessarily mean demographically. Whether a customer is a man, a woman, rich or poor, it's not really as important as his or her motivations for using a product. So I mean the diversity of reasons people buy from the company. One brand might cater to people looking for cheap and reliable, while another brand might appeal to people looking for luxurious and fast. A company might cater to both segments because it has the strategic assets and excess capacity to do so. This is a smart strategic move. But just because one company is doing it, doesn't mean there should only be one brand. I put together this spreadsheet for you guys. It's some homework. It is a workbook to help you put together a comprehensive brand plan. Now, the most important thing I want to call out here is that this is almost 100% based on the book Strategic Brand Management. I am not an affiliate. I don't get any kickbacks by promoting this book, but I highly recommend you check it out. I worked at a branding and marketing agency for five years, developing brands for various types of companies. And I can tell you that until I read this book, I did not really have a strategic understanding of what branding really was. I was very tactical. I was very experimental. This helped me put it all together and uh, make me a next level branding expert. So if that's your aspiration, you want to be a six-figure brand manager or you want to be a high-level consultant in the branding space, definitely worth checking out. And that's what this workbook is based off of. So let's get down to it. Basically, there are two components to your brand plan. Uh, you know, if we ignore some of the quantitative aspects like setting objectives and things like that. When it comes to actual execution, you're talking about brand strategy and you're talking about brand tactics. Now, the first part of brand strategy is the target market. The most important part here, of course, is the target customers, but that is not the only part of the target market. The other key components are going to be things like the market conditions, the partners that you're working with, that you have joint ventures with. It's also your company. So when we segue into the value proposition, what we need to think about is how we're creating value for the customer over and above what the competitors are, because the competitors are also in the target market. Also, how the brand creates value for the collaborators, our partners, and how it creates value for the company itself. Because there's no point in investing in a brand if it's not going to kind of have some sort of return on investment for the business. The other important thing I want you to understand is that the brand creates value that is separate from your products and your services. Okay, And often that value is intangible. Sometimes it's tangible, but often it's very uh, psychological and less focused on uh, immediate, obvious, quantifiable things that often are the case when you're selling, uh, when you're when you're talking about value created from the product itself. So if we think about this for a moment uh, in reverse, so for example, let's say that one of our partners is a, a key influencer, uh, a celebrity, and then that celebrity is wrapped up in a scandal. The, the brand value of that influencer endorsing our product may, may go down if people start boycotting that person, etc. So nothing's fundamentally changed other than the brand, the perception of that person. But that has a detrimental impact to us because we partner with them. The reverse is also true. If you have invested in a good brand that has a strong reputation, broad brand awareness, then that provides a lot of value for your partners. It also provides a lot of value for customers in many different ways. And we're going to talk about what those are, but some of those are just the feeling of security that you're buying something that's recognizable. When you buy things that are recognizable, you feel safer, you feel like it's going to work out, you feel like it's reliable, and there are a lot of, uh, a lot of value that's created there. So basically, 
brands create value in three different ways. And when we're talking about value here, most of the work is the customer value proposition. How are we creating value for customers? And the first way is with functional value. Now, uh, the second way is with psychological value, and the third way is with monetary value. So it's up to you how granular you want to get with your plan. You could just leave it at functional value and write some notes down here about how you could create functional value and psychological value, or you can go into more detail into these kind of subsections and put uh, ideas here too. Um, you know, if you're if you're a fairly large company that's been around for a while, you probably want to get into the nitty gritty details. If you're a fresh brand, you want to be a bit agile, you can kind of just do some broad strokes here. Okay, so functional value is things like, are, are you telling the world, the customers, who built the product? You know, for example, Zoom is by PayPal, and that's embedded in their, uh, in their branding. Okay, so that's, that's telling me who who is delivering the, the service, the product. Uh, the signaling benefit is signaling certain things like um, functional functionality. You, this product will um, integrate A and B, for example, or it will speed up your processes, or it'll save you money, signaling. Now, performance benefit is really interesting because this, this is a functional benefit people don't realize when they think of brands, is the brand can actually change the experience or the performance of the product <clears throat> now for example uh, uh, drugs the the objective is to take away pain but a lot of pain is actually in your mind so if the brand if you believe in the brand the pain will go away there's a placebo effect there that's real and that's a performance benefit similarly uh, when i drink coca-cola out of a little glass bottle the performance, the, the, the experience or the taste experience of the product is better because so much of it has to do with my cognitions. And I showed you the example before about taste perception. Okay, so now we have psychological value, which is typically what people think of when they think of brands. And <clears throat> there's a very good reason for that. And one of the main reasons is that brands and brand building, brand awareness has to do with long-term impact. Um, so if you think about short-term marketing, which is in the business-to-business -business space, demand generation, <clears throat> and in the business-consumer space, it's performance marketing, you often focus on very rational things, like you're going to get 10% off if you act now, that type of thing. And then you choose whether or not to act on it. But when you're dealing with long-term results, which, which brand building is, and it tends to be beyond six months or even beyond a decade, what you're doing is you're embedding yourself into the long-term psyche of customers so that when a purchase need arises, you instantly come to mind because you're embedded in, in, in the, the memory of people. And the easiest way to embed yourself in the memory of people is by using emotions, not by using rational thinking. So we have the emotional benefits of the, the brand, which helps create a better emotional experience uh, when you're, you're using or buying uh, this product. There is also a self-expressive benefit. So the brand helps me uh, present to the world what type of person I am. Oh, I'm smart, or I'm part of a snowboarding community, something like that. There's also the societal benefit. So often brands align themselves with environmentalism or with giving shoes to, to people in poor countries. Or we gave the example of Lacoste and aligning themselves with endangered species protection and National Geographic and kind of this global conservatory um, marketing. Now, the last key thing here is monetary value. And there's a tendency to sometimes think that luxury brands or brands that command price premiums are better but it's not necessarily true. So for example, when I go to Walmart and I see a yellow sticker, that's part of their branding, the yellow and the smiley face and stuff. But that brand is serving its function, which is signaling the price. They're signaling that the price is cheap. And sometimes Walmart's not the cheapest, but their branding does a good job of creating the perception of signaling that the price is cheap. Now, the financial benefit is where the brand actually enhances the monetary value of the product. So a good example of this is business to business. Let's say you're selling uh, some sort of ingredient, um, maybe like Intel inside. Now, 
what you're doing is you're actually enhancing the ability of a laptop manufacturer to sell at a higher price because the Intel brand is inside it. So you're, you're enhancing the monetary value, which is kind of more of a concrete value created from the brand that we don't normally think of. So this is an overview of the brand strategy. In the next lecture, what we'll do is get into the nitty gritty details of brand tactics. Once again, it comes from the book, Strategic Brand Management. The second key component of your brand plan, and again, this is based on the book, Strategic Brand Management, is the brand tactics. The brand tactics are where you're probably going to spend a lot of your time sorting out the details before you actually go to market with the execution. And we have basically two components of tactics. There's the brand design, which is typically what most people think of. They think of a logo when they think of branding. And then there's the brand communication. So we're going to start with brand design. There are two components to brand design, so subcategories within the subcategory. The identifiers, which identify who is selling the product or service or what the identity is of the person that's sort of marketing these products. And then there's the reference. So these are the kind of associations that are aligned with the, the brand. And the identifiers are the name, your brand name, your logo, which is sometimes called a brand mark. There's the motto, you know, some, there's some nomenclature here people play with. They might say slogan, something like that. Character. I think this is the most underutilized brand tactic, especially in business to business. Having a mascot, a character, some sort of weird animal, tremendously effective in terms of cognition and memory and, and being able to stand out and be be memorable as a brand. And if, if you don't believe me, you can even look at some of the most logical business to business brands and why going with an impactful mascot can make a huge difference. You can check out the B2B Institute if you want more data on that. All right, sound mark. So when you open up Netflix, for example, there's this boom, boom, like that's a sound mark. That's part of how they, they build the brand and a strong identity around the brand. Product design. So unique design, the glass bottle shape, the hourglass figure of the, the Coca-Cola bottle, for example. And then the packaging, which is, is going to be very, very important, especially when you're, you're dealing with consumer packaged goods. Um, okay, so reference. So the kinds of things that you're, you're associating the brand with. And this is something I talked about when we were mentioning Lacoste, right? A lot of Lacoste's identity is hollow until it gets aligned with other things. So why would a crocodile represent luxury in sport? It, it doesn't. It's a, a shell that can be filled with anything. But the second you see John F. Kennedy wearing a crocodile, he becomes a referent. It's like, oh, okay, well, John, I associate John F. Kennedy with kind of a cool playboy luxury sports person. So Lacoste, by association, must be like that. Lacoste is in the cool crowd or the nerdy crowd, depending on uh, how young or old you are. Uh, so we have all types of reference. Ne certain needs that people have. So if you're selling insurance, you know, their need might be the feeling of security or, uh, you know, f alleviating anxiety, benefits, how we're kind of filling those needs, experiences, you know, travel or, or birth, those um, getting married, occasions, again, falling into uh, experiences, at certain types of activities. So tennis, for example, places, people, People is very, very important. I've mentioned throughout numerous courses that you need to identify the people you want to associate with and you find them using uh, various influencer tools, one of which is available for free is called SparkToro. Certain types of objects that you want to be aligned with and uh, other products and services. So co-branding becomes very important, uh, as I mentioned in, the, lux in the, the luxury brand case with Lacoste. We are partnering up with and associating with other other brands and companies is catapulting your brand in terms of uh, entering markets. Okay, so that's the brand design. So these are these are things that you're you're building from a design perspective, and it's not just visual design; it's also um, auditory design, music design, that sort of thing, sound design.
Okay, so now now there's the brand communication, and we're gonna there are two components to this. There's the media, which is kind of how the content get distri gets distributed. It's the touch points that you're having with customers, and then there's the creative. So this is the thing that you kind of build in house before it gets distributed. And let's start with looking at what those various types of media are. Now, for a lot of you, if you're in startups, it's going to be almost 100% online. Um, but uh, there are other touch points that we can use. So, for example, TV. I, I did some TV advertising, and I, I was monitoring brand awareness. And you can see once the TV ads go on that there's this huge spike in awareness that uh, is never going to be achieved from something like Google PPC ads. So I, I can run Google PPC ads for six months and barely a blip in brand awareness. The second you launch those TV or cinema ads, boom, brand awareness skyrockets. All right, radio, um, you know, you might want to throw in podcasts here too as kind of the modern variant to this. Print, I, I would add in here like direct mail, which I, I think is extremely effective, especially in, in the business to business enterprise space. Online, and you're going to get into tons of tactical details here. So doing things like brand awareness video campaigns on LinkedIn and Facebook, doing uh, Twitter posts that get reposted by influencers, all sorts of tactical things here. The place, so the physical places, point of sale, those types of things. In person, so you might have like in-person salespeople, you might have social selling, Avon style. And, and then the, the packaging itself can communicate a lot of things too. So I gave the example of the, the Bloom brand and how I use the packaging to communicate the feeling of vitality because people with arthritis uh, tend to feel low energy and, and tired all the time. The packaging becomes a, a, a media touch point. Now, the creative is one area where you're going to spend a lot of time and it's, it's coming up with a lot of what dictates your brand guide or the approach that you're going to take with your branding. So it's how the design and the positioning are expressed. So, you know, positioning yourself around like a specific emotion, you might say the way we're going to express that emotion is by using authentic images of real customers instead of stock photography, for example. Um, that would be one, one of the rules that you have in your, your, the creative for your brand and positioning is, um, basically figuring out what kind of position you want your brand to have in the minds of the customers. Like maybe they, they think of it as um, expensive, but not overpriced. And they think of it as alleviating a lot of frustration. And the way that you're going to secure that position is by focusing on certain things in your marketing communications and not others. So you have to make a strategic choice of what gets emphasized in your brand messaging and that's that's the creative aspect of your brand tactics when we talk about awareness marketing often it's associated with brand marketing where what you're trying to do is raise the level of awareness of your brand and i've done this and i've looked at the data and you're looking at basically two things aided awareness and unaided awareness and that's the general uh, way that you do consumer awareness marketing with brands but when we're doing a LinkedIn awareness marketing business to business awareness marketing often we're more interested in more granular level of awareness it's not just generally do they know your name because you can blast your name out there and people are familiar with your logo but who really cares right just because they know your logo they're familiar with your brand name doesn't mean they have any deeper level of understanding it doesn't mean that you're actually moving them closer to making a purchase so we're using this framework of awareness as a, a, a default, and I've talked about this in other courses. So the four levels start with problem on aware. So these are people that don't even know that they have a problem. So in cases like that, you need to educate them about why this is a serious problem in your industry or for people in your position, etc. Now, the second stage is where people are familiar with the problem, but they're not aware that the category of product that you're selling is the solution or the best solution to the problem that they have. Now, if they're familiar with the category, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're familiar with your product. So this is typically where what people think of when they think of awareness, right? It's making people aware of your brand, making people aware of your product. 
But you can see that uh, often campaigns fail because they um, perhaps start here, or spend too much time here, and not enough time here. So if if I don't I don't even know the category of product that you market, uh, I'm, I'm not ready for a message talking about why you're the best one because I don't even care. I, I, I'm not educated enough to care about the fact that you are the best. And if I don't even know that I have, that this is a problem, then I'm certainly not ready to hear a message about why you're the solution. What I need to hear a message about is why this is a problem. I need proof that this is a problem. I need research, things like that. So when you're thinking about things like creating video ads, creating upper funnel information, you need to think about what stage of awareness the target groups are at. And you may need to experiment because maybe perhaps you don't know what level of awareness they're at and you'll see what types of messages they respond to. So when people are aware of your product, which is stage four, um, this is where there's typically a fixation with uh, direct response offers and things like a oh, limited time offer to get a free trial or to sign up or to buy now. And that's that's where the really interesting time sensitive uh, sales oriented type of marketing takes place. So when you're creating an awareness campaign, I don't want you to think it's just broad based brand awareness. It's more education and persuasion that meets the customers where they're at based on their level of ignorance or their level of education in terms of the solution that you offer. As you transition from intermediate LinkedIn advertising to more advanced LinkedIn advertising, you need to start thinking a bit more in the way that consumer brand marketers start to think. Now, don't get turned off when I say that because often what people do is they associate that type of marketing with we're just throwing money at the wall and hoping that customers end up buying. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that you need to think both in terms of the high level <clears throat> awareness marketing and then in terms of the, the transition from that upper funnel type of thinking to segueing into actual revenue pipeline. So the way that I did consumer marketing was basically creating tons of awareness by throwing millions of dollars at TV campaigns. So I remember doing this one national campaign where uh, I was tracking awareness for a new brand that I was working on using Nielsen data. And uh, so, so Nielsen has these panels of consumers and they basically survey them to find out uh, if they're familiar with your brand and other brands in the market, yes, yes or no. And what I saw was there was kind of a, a steady level of awareness when I'm looking at the data. I'm like, okay, yeah, maybe 2% of the people in our target customer group are aware of, of this brand. And then suddenly there's this huge spike where awareness goes through the roof. And um, the reason that that happens is basically when the, the TV campaigns or any, any campaigns that you're running through video on, uh, like in cinemas, etc. Those are the things that spike awareness. Now, the other thing that you typically track with consumer marketing is purchase intent. So there's kind of two basic metrics, right? Are they aware of your brand, your product, and do they intend to buy it? Are they actually interested in buying it? And, and the disconnect between those two things is usually an opportunity where a marketer or a brand manager can, can make decisions in the marketing about how to fix that disconnect. So the spike in awareness usually comes most efficiently when you're doing video and in consumer marketing that's usually through television so that's doing that's when i'm working for a very large company now i've also worked for medium sized companies or kind of on the verge of becoming large companies and i remember one company i worked for was very very successful with direct response advertising and then they tried to experiment with television so Given that they had expertise in direct response and were very good at it, and don't get me wrong, the company was very successful, uh, the way the approach they took with television was let's make a direct response, right? Almost like an infomercial. And there, there is a lot of marketing ethos out there that will tell you that 
the way that you should approach marketing is like an, a cheesy infomercial, right? Because cheesy infomercials solicit responses. And, and there's this whole camp of people that think direct responses is better. So, of course, that's the approach you should take when you do television. Um, that campaign was not that successful. And I, I think the reason is because when you're, when you're doing that kind of video marketing advertising in general, it's best suited for awareness. It's best suited for making people educated, familiar with your brand, aware of a solution to the problem, and less good at things that can be easily attributed and measured. And I think this is a problem that a lot of advertisers run into with digital advertising is they think uh, things that can be measured are better. But what ends up happening is you tend to measure things in little discrete chunks. Uh, this, this LinkedIn ad did this well. This email follow-up that we put the LinkedIn leads that were captured into perform well. But what I want you to do when you're doing advanced LinkedIn advertising is you need to think broader. Okay, This campaign did better than that campaign. The number of customers acquired using this strategy was more effective than that strategy. Or the follow-up automated email sequence that we did performed better than the other sequence instead of just saying this follow-up email performed better than that follow-up email. So you're thinking broader in terms of the campaigns, in terms of the strategies, and in terms of the timeline. So let's think about what happens in a month instead of what happened in a week. Let's think about quarterly pipeline performance in, instead of just you know how many direct responses do we get today, will we get tomorrow, that sort of thinking. Now, the, the, over, the overall point that I want to make is that as you start to segue into advanced campaigns with LinkedIn advertising, awareness and education is going to become more, going to become more important. And the default position you should probably have is that video is one of the easiest ways to do that. And fortunately, with LinkedIn, there's lots of excellent things you can do with video advertising. Video advertising is also fairly cost effective um, when you compare to alternatives such as uh, uh, Facebook advertising. Now, when you look at something like YouTube advertising, um, you know, maybe better when you're going after a broader market, but you're going to have much, much more targeted awareness uh, when you do LinkedIn video ads. And it, it's probably the single easiest, most friction-free way of transitioning from we're only doing direct response advertising to we're going to do awareness and direct response advertising, and we're going to start that awareness using videos. One of the single easiest ways of creating awareness when you don't have a multi-million dollar budget to run a TV campaign, for example, or perhaps you're not willing to gamble on something super creative that's designed to generate word of mouth. In cases like that, Facebook can be one of the most effective channels for you. And I'm just going to show you an example of a quick campaign I put together recently. So I'm going to go into this campaign. And what I'm doing with the campaign is I'm ra raising awareness by promoting a PDF. And you can see here that I have two different ad sets. Now, the targeting details in Facebook are within the ad set level, uh, which is a bit different from other channels such as LinkedIn, where uh, you would find it more at the campaign level. So what we're going to do is take a look at these, and we can see that uh, out of these two different ad sets, I had a cost per click, uh, which is a, a per link click of 30 cents for this ad set and 66 cents, so about double for this ad set. We can see here the reach is about half here, and uh, 13, about 13,000, about 7,000. Impressions were about the same. So uh, what that tells us is that the, uh, the frequency is probably higher within this campaign relative to this, uh, excuse me, this ad set relative to this ad set. And we can see that uh, over here, 
Facebook, what it does conveniently is it puts the frequency in the column. It's, it's less hidden than it is uh, when you're using something like LinkedIn. And uh, we do see that the frequency is almost two for this ad set and uh, about 1.27 for the first. Now let's go into this to get a closer look at what exactly the campaign is. So one of the most important things I want to highlight is that the, the campaign is uh, optimized for traffic. So I'm actually trying to generate traffic. I'm not doing what you typically do in the direct response mindset, which is optimized for leads or for pipeline revenue or something like that. So when you're running an awareness campaign, uh, and it doesn't really matter what type of awareness you're talking about, if you're talking about category awareness, product awareness, etc. What you're trying to do is you're, you're trying to get as many people as possible within the target customer group to consume the content, to become educated, to become aware. It, whether they uh, actually buy is, is kind of irrelevant because your goal is awareness, your role, your role is education. And what that translates to is content consumption. And the easiest way to get content consumed is put people through as few hoops as possible. So they don't have to put in their email. They don't have to click. Ideally, they wouldn't have to click, but in many cases, you're going to have to do that anyways just to supply them with the content. But avoid gating and just optimize consumption. So the targeting in this case is based on an imported list. Now, uh, what LinkedIn, or excuse me, what Facebook allows you to do is to expand that audience. So let's say you have about 5,000 customers. You can import the 5,000 customers. I imported 7,000 uh, contacts in this case. And then Facebook allows you to expand that. Uh, and depending on how much you want to expand it, you have some control over that. You can also narrow it by using demographic information. So you might say, well, realistically, someone 18 years old, probably not going to be a good candidate for the product. So what you might do is come in here and change it to, say, 25. Uh, all genders, you know, depending on your cases, you can also add in other parameters based on interests and behavior, so kind of the negative targeting. Now, similar with LinkedIn ads, uh, Facebook compels you to set in geographic limitations. So basically what I do is pretty much put in global ones. So I'll put in the entire continent of Asia, continent of Europe, North America, et cetera, uh, add in Australia, New Zealand, and, and you, can, you can choose whether you want to put in everywhere or not, uh, realistically based on uh, what industry you're in. One parameter that you might want to consider adding is language. So if your advertisement, your ebook, your white paper, whatever is only in English, uh, then setting that as a restriction is, is a sensible choice. Now, in this case, the objective is to get as many people as possible within the group to read an educational PDF that I put together that has a lot of detailed, useful educational information. And so, I have some optimization choices that Facebook gives me. So link clicks, so landing page views, link clicks, daily unique reach, impressions. So basically, if you want people to show up and on your landing page, then you're going to want to put landing page views as the optimization. And then what Facebook will do is it'll algorithm uh, algorithmically optimize to get as many landing page views as possible. Now, in my case, what I'm doing is I'm just driving people to the Google Drive link where they get access to the PDF. I'm not doing what most people do, which is send people to a landing page where they have to fill out some stupid form in order to be able to see the PDF. My objective is to get people to read as many people as possible reading the PDF because there is a call to action at the bottom of almost every page in the PDF to go to other content that I'm actually selling that you have to pay for. So it's kind of the first stage in the funnel is kind of this awareness where uh, I, I'm making people aware of me, I'm making people aware of the information that I can provide, and then step two is actually getting the conversion. So here is how the specific ad is set up. You can see that it has to come from uh, my Facebook page. I've also linked it to an Instagram page. So Facebook will allow you to create awareness on Instagram simultaneously as long as you sync it with a proper account. We can see that I have some different image options. So I'm going with a single image ad because I've, I've seen that be successful on multiple channels, including Facebook and LinkedIn. Carousel ads, generally a waste of time from my experience, unless uh, perhaps you're doing e-commerce and you're kind of marketing a catalog of different items, then I think it may be appropriate. Uh, but I, I personally haven't had any success with that. Um, so we can see that Facebook 
algorithmically kind of figures out or using machine learning all different sizing options of how to promote this you know in streams and stories and write columns and resizing etc i have the option of putting in uh, the primary text which shows up above the image i also have a uh, headline here which is going to show up below the image in most cases and uh, one thing to point out here is that I'm, I'm highlighting an objection that people have an objection when they see an ad is they don't want to click it because one it's going to take time to load and two they're going to have to put in their email or something so i'm objecting uh, addressing both of those i'm saying instantly you can access the pdf instantly and there's no email needed uh, one of the key things to do in your ads is address objections up front so that people have no excuse to say no and we can see that uh, optimized text per person to website. So I'm trying to drive people to this Google Drive link, which is just for the PDF. And uh, we have the call to action here. I don't personally know which one would be better. I, I, I went with a uh, download here, um, but I could, I could certainly see something like learn more, which sounds like a softer offer working. Because in this case, download uh, kind of implies you need to download something to your your device to be able to read it. In my case, you can actually just read it in the browser. Um, so I, I wasn't sure which one to go with, but I, I opted for download. It seemed to work. And we can see what the ad looks like here. So it's a sponsored ad with some information about key takeaways you're going to get from reading the PDF and then download. And then when you click this, you're brought immediately to the white paper that I've written. And I have this little um, ribbon type thing on the top left saying that it's free and uh, you know you get instant access without putting in an email. What I recommend when you're launching a campaign like this is you probably want to start with some broad targeting to begin with. And the reason is because if you go with very broad targeting, what's going to happen is, well, first of all, your your costs are going to be cheaper. It's, 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 very, it's cheaper on Facebook to target a broader audience than to target a narrow, narrow audience, generally speaking. The other thing is that when when you do this you can get some initial social proof so uh what's going to happen is facebook's kind of automatically going to serve people that are responsive that engage so you're you might get like 12 likes tw uh, you know a couple loves on your post maybe maybe some comments if you're lucky and so that that's kind of the initial momentum that uh, may enable further kind of engagement and word of mouth uh, later on and then what I would do is I would narrow your your audience targeting to uh, specifically uh, who you think will actually buy the product and then when they see there's 20 likes on your your advertisement your post uh, then they're more likely to pay attention to it what I'm going to show you right now is something that you're probably not used to seeing with LinkedIn advertising or advertising in business to business in general which is a campaign that's designed not for direct response at all. This is purely about education and awareness and the KPI has nothing to do with g capturing leads or generating clicks, anything like that. It's all about consuming content. And all that I did was this, took this software company's video, it was a very, very high production video uh, showing people that have used the product at very credible companies like Coca-Cola and they're just talking about what their experience is. So it's kind of like a, a case study slash testimonial type video uh, for this software that is going to be purchased by people in the mid-market and enterprise space. So we're not talking about SMB types of products that we're advertising through LinkedIn here. And what that often means is that the, the sales cycle is longer. So it's not just about how do we capture leads immediately or capture buying intent immediately. It's more a long term. How do we nurture this group of prospective customers that uh, are perhaps high level managers at mid sized and, and large companies? Now, what I did was created a video views campaign and you see that there is a call to action at the bottom. Now, doesn't really matter because I'm not I'm not trying to generate signups or anything like that. But, uh, you know, I do talk about that. There's a free trial and they can click learn more, which goes to the website, a particular page on the website that's relevant uh, to this modular, uh, this module that I'm selling. And there's text above the video that basically just describes many of the use cases, features, etc. Uh, available uh, within the software and then the video. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at how this performed in the uh, 
campaign manager here. And you can see that there are, are two elements here. And uh, what I'm going to do is focus on this variant because it, it had the, the most data that we can look at and analyze. One of the most important things when you're looking at the performance of a video views campaign where the objective is not lead generation, but it's actual video views, which again is probably the easiest way to do awareness marketing, is looking at the columns here. Now the default in this position is going to be performance. And performance, you know, it might lead you to look at things like clicks and leads, etc. But that's not that's not what we're aiming for here. So specifically what you want to do is go down to the video metrics because then it's going to give you a more granular picture of what's happening. So if we look at the amount that was spent, so 225 basically Australian dollars, we got about 3,000 views. But the thing is, a view doesn't really tell you much on LinkedIn. A view is somebody watched two seconds of the video now. Are they going to recall anything after watching two seconds? No, I think that's kind of LinkedIn inflating their numbers a bit. And we see that it costs seven cents to get people to, to view for two seconds. But what we really want to get into is the uh, how many people actually watch 25% of the video, 50% of the video, etc. Now you can look at impressions and clicks, but that, that's not what we're optimizing for. And we see the click-through rate, 0.05%, not, not spectacular, um, but who cares, right? We're not, we're not trying to optimize for clicks. We're going to do that later, and that's going to be follow-up campaigns that we run with LinkedIn. So the most important information here is going to be in, in this side of the video's metrics. So we can see we got uh, an effective cost per estimated cost per view of seven seconds. Now the reason they're giving us this estimated number is because some of the views are, are going to come for free. So there's the paid views, uh, which happens to be the exact same number, but then sometimes there's uh, going to be free people that, that watch it because it gets shared on their social network or something like that, but that, that doesn't seem to be the case here, um, so it's not really important. Um, but what is important is how many people actually watched a quarter of the video, almost 500, how many people watched 50%, 75%, how many people actually completed it, uh, what is the completion rate. But the, all of this is, is nice to look at, right? The, the completion rate, the view rate, etc. But the most important numbers are really going to come down to money. How much money did it cost to get somebody to actually consume that video? And what we want to know is, is the, the way we approach LinkedIn advertising to educate people about our, about our product more cost effective than doing something else, like attending a trade show, or perhaps running a campaign on YouTube, or paying to get people to click through to our website and then watch our video. And what I'm going to do is we're going to take this, uh, I'm going to show you how I took this information, put it into a spreadsheet, and then analyzed it from a financial perspective. Instead of just looking at, oh, this many number completed it, it's how much money did it take to actually get the performance we want. So unfortunately, LinkedIn doesn't make this readily available, but who can blame them? I mean, they, they provide a lot of value and uh, it's okay if that's the default that they have in their analytics. But what I've done here is I've put in the number of views that we had at two seconds. So it's what LinkedIn calls a view. We have about 3,000, 25% is around 500, around 450%, 75% uh, 313. Now, their metric for completions or their standard for what is a video completion is 97 to 100% of your video, right? Often the very end of your video is just some sort of uh, you know animated graphic or credits or something so uh, they say okay if they watch 75 percent they completed it and uh, so we had 270 people do that and now what i'm looking at is the total spend here which is 224 australian dollars and i'm just dividing that by the number of views in each case so we see that it was seven cents to get people to watch two seconds 45 cents to get them to watch a quarter of the video but 60 cents to get them to watch half the video, 71% to get them, 71 cents, excuse me, to get 75% of the video, and 83 cents to get people to actually watch the full video. So what we're looking at here is a campaign, highly targeted campaign targeting specific job titles at 
companies that had something like over 200 employees in a very specific market. Um, so we're looking at like Australia mostly. And it cost us only 63 cents to get these very targeted people to complete, to watch at least 97% of a video. That's effectively a case study, an advertisement for this enterprise contract software. 63 cents. Now, how much would be the cost per click on Google? Cost per click numbers are, are going through the roof. I mean, when I when I became certified in Google, typically for business to business, I was paying maybe around five dollars per click. Uh, some markets cost per clicks are going above fifteen dollars. Like, I mean, has anybody ever paid sixty dollars per click? If you're going after very very targeted groups of people, uh, your cost per click and that that enterprise in market buyer group is going to be through the roof. But here, we're able to pinpoint the exact decision makers in that exact market, which is the biggest single advantage that LinkedIn advertising has is that targeting capabilities. Get them to consume, become aware, become educated about our product, and it costs us 63 cents. Phenomenal. I bet you, if you try to do the same thing with Google advertising or Facebook advertising, you're going to be paying $5.00 if not more, just to get people to click through to your home page. And then they may abandon before they even get there. And then when they get there, they may not even click the play button. So they may have a fraction of the level of awareness that we're able to achieve by simply promoting a video right there on LinkedIn to the exact group of people. And that's the problem that we face with other social media channels or other advertising channels in general, is that we don't not only are we paying more to get people to consume content in a lot of cases, but 75% of the time, it's not even the people we want consuming. Here, I'm saying I only want these people with this level of seniority watching the video, and I'm only paying 63 cents to do it. There are a couple of hidden metrics in LinkedIn advertising that you need to pay attention to when you're getting into more advanced advertising. And these are two metrics that business to business marketers generally don't focus on. It's more of a focus in consumer marketing and it's a very important aspect of advertising strategy. So not marketing strategy, but advertising strategy specifically. And that is the, the reach and the frequency, two of the most important variables when we're thinking about more traditional advertising, which is what you need to get into uh, if you really want to scale up your LinkedIn ads. So uh, I want to talk about frequency. So this is the average number of impressions shown to each member account that received at least one impression. So when you're running ads, people are going to see it over and over. Um, by default, you tend to think of people just seeing it once and did they sign up or not? Did they direct respond or not? Which is the obsession of uh, business to business marketers. But again, when we're more advanced, we're getting out of that direct response mindset. Success does not always mean direct response, especially when we're dealing with upper funnel, uh, early mid stage marketing and nurturing in general too, because we're focused on consumption education, not responses and action. So um, the number of times they see it is important. So I, I was chatting with a, a colleague of mine who works in very advanced demand generation. He's looking at quantitative data all the time. And uh, one of the things he discovered was that this variable frequency was actually incredibly important and one of the strongest predictors of whether the, the LinkedIn ads performed well. And he found that the magic number was around six. So for his campaign, which I believe lasted a couple of months, uh, if somebody was exposed to their message six times, that was a strong predictor that they would uh, be become uh, what I believe is like a qualified lead or, or uh, acquire customer, something close to an acquire customer anyways. <clears throat> so the way that you pay attention to the frequency is you need to go in here under columns and go to delivery. And uh, something I, I've neglected to look at in the past, and I don't want you to do that. Look at the delivery, because what you may find is you identify your target customer group. 
and in this case I think I started with 5,000 and then we expand it from there um, but you may be like oh well I'm hitting 5,000 people uh, well you're not maybe you're hitting uh, 400 people and they're just seeing your ad 10 times per day which um, they might actually get annoyed with seeing the same thing over and over you need to monitor that frequency um, the other thing you need to pay attention to is the reach so the reach is the actual number of people that are seeing the ad so your target group may be 20,000 right that's the the customer group that you're you're targeting in LinkedIn and that's great targeting is excellent but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're logged into LinkedIn and they're actually seeing your ad because a lot of people uh, they only use LinkedIn like once a month or only when they're looking for a job and they're not super engaged the way they would be with something like Facebook or Twitter should have high daily engagement so uh, the reach is important to pay attention to because this tells you who who you're actually targeting not who you want to target who you've set up to target but who's actually seeing the content um, and that that may tell you why your your marketing is underperforming in terms of absolute numbers is just that the reach is too small the frequency is too small uh, so in, in this case uh, for example what we had to do was because we're dealing with a limited geography and adding other geographies only added about a thousand people to the target audience which is only a fraction of that's going to be added to the reach uh, what we had to do was expand beyond the specific industries that we were targeting so it was all these job titles uh, but then took away the restriction in terms of industries uh, to go after a, a wider audience to, in order to be able to increase the reach and to reduce the frequency because the problem was the frequency was way too high so what LinkedIn's going to try to do is they're going to set you up with <clears throat> the video views campaign and you're going to set a daily budget I recommend starting with daily budget don't start with campaign budget and you're going to put in something like a hundred dollars and what they're going to do is they're going to do everything in their power to maximize the number of views you get per day with that a hundred dollars now LinkedIn's tricky you got to be careful with them they're going to spend your money even in ways you don't want to they're also by default going to expand your target audience you don't want that either because you you want to target who you want to target don't let don't give LinkedIn control <clears throat> so what's going to end up happening is you're going to be paying for views from people that already viewed your video and that may not be what you want maybe it's what you want but uh, I'm guessing it's not uh, so be careful uh, the good thing here is we were able to get the frequency down uh, frequency uh, I believe is around seven seven close to eight and um, you don't necessarily need to expand your audience okay and maybe uh, in your case maybe it's fine you just want to target this particular group maybe you're doing like account-based marketing with limited target there's only so many people that are, are qualified to even purchase your software uh, so in that case what you're gonna do is you need to keep lowering the budget the daily budget for your video views campaign until the frequency becomes uh, around one or a little over one uh, because if it's if it's at one you you could spend more uh, but if it's a little over one then, then LinkedIn's kind of pushing to try to get uh, more views then you, you've reached a threshold and it may even be the minimum it might be uh, ten dollars per day and that's fine you just keep running your video views awareness campaign uh, on a, the minimum daily budget because you've reached the saturation point where uh, you're able to reach as many people in your target audience as possible uh, at a frequency that is not more than one uh, and that's fine and that's what you do uh, which is great because then as your list starts building then you're able to retarget them with more uh, direct response offers so I just want to show you what that looked like now the target audience size when I did this was much much smaller than uh, what you can see currently 45,000 because we had only focused on a specific some uh, three industries uh, so basically I reached the point where the minimum budget was all that I wanted to spend so I try to put in nine dollars here it says your minimum budget must be at least 10 so to run a video views campaign has to be at least 10 and then uh, the manual bidding I hit the the minimum cost which is six cents can't go any lower than that and uh, important to have the bidding strategy here which is uh, manual bidding you you want as much control as possible don't give LinkedIn control so minimum budget 
minimum bid per video view, so very efficient campaign. Um, the only challenge is that it's difficult to scale it up without ex expanding the audience or loosening criteria in some way. I want to take a look at this article because it's going to give us some useful insights into the kinds of key performance indicators that we're focusing on when it comes to brand marketing as opposed to something like demand generation or performance marketing. So this is Reach, Frequency, Advertising, and Brands by Paul Friedrichsen, who's been in marketing for many, many years. And uh, let's just take a look what his stance is on this. So he's, he's, he's focusing on two of the most important parameters, which I've, I've talked about earlier. One is reach, so how many, how many people you're actually uh, reaching with your ads, which is sometimes different from your targeting. So you may be targeting 100,000 people through your Facebook, LinkedIn ads, but the amount of people that are actually being exposed to your advertisement might only be 50% of that or whatever. So uh, make sure you differentiate between the target the theoretical reach versus the actual reach so who, who's actually being exposed to the ad because for example if nobody's logging into Facebook they're never going to see your ad even though they're in the targeting group same thing with LinkedIn even more so with LinkedIn because uh, people don't use the application as much as frequently and then the other is frequency so it's the number of exposures in a given time period so the time period might be the length of the campaign or it might be just uh, on a per weekly basis something like that now, one of the most important things he's highlighting here is the importance of repetition, which is something I've talked about before. Repetition is very important, and here's, here's why. When, we, when you have a conversation with somebody and you're, you're, trying to, you're trying to get something across, you're trying to deliver instructions, and I run into this all the time because I, sometimes I make very, very specific orders for things, like when I order food, and I have, like, you know, I want this, this, and this, and... Uh, what ends up happening is uh, you, you never have the full attention of somebody. So even though I was very detailed with the instructions, there, there's bound to be something that goes wrong. Like they forget the sauce or they forget to cut it small, you know, something like that. And even when you're having a conversation with somebody who loves you and has, is really has full attention on you, they're still not going to remember everything you say, uh, even if they're trying to. And because memories are fundamentally faulty, we have tons of psychological research to show uh, that people come up with false memories. Uh, they don't. They don't necessarily listen. Necessarily listen. Now, when you're doing something like advertising, it's it's infinitely more true because often people are just sort of passively seeing your ad when they're scrolling through Facebook or when they're on YouTube or whatever. You never have their full attention. Very rarely would you have their full attention. Even if you do have their full attention, uh, there are they're not going to take in everything they're saying because it's too fast, there's too much information, um, etc. So what, what happens, there's this inherent bias that happens with marketers where they're very focused on their brand. Every single day they're thinking about their campaign, they're thinking about the emails that they're putting out, they're thinking about the new product features, the new service offerings. So it's very much top of mind for you. And you kind of think, oh, well, if, if I just deliver the message once, uh, that's sufficient. Oh, oh if, if I deliver the same message three times, they're going to get annoyed. They're, they're, they're not going to remember anything. But <laughs> you are overestimating the amount that people are focusing on you. You're actually being very self-centered when you have that attitude. People barely notice what you do. Okay? They kind of skim your emails. They might casually look at your ads. So you actually need to repeat over and over and over so that anything sinks in their head. Now, this is particularly true when you want to raise brand awareness for people that are out of market that aren't in a buying mindset. You need to like drill that into their head over and over so that they will remember it in a year's time, six months time when they do have a buying need. So repetition is extremely important. Repetition is the glue. So one of the key questions though becomes how much repetition? And we see with the Facebook ads, we have some data to give us um, some insights into what the frequency should be, but it's also going to depend on your situation. So if you have limited funds, if you have a small target customer group, like these are variables to consider. Now, I really love uh, what this point that he's making, which is, um, you know, if you're in this situation where you need to be very focused and concentrated with your resources, focus on advertising frequency targeted at opinion leaders and hardcore users. I love it absolutely love this. I'm a huge fan of what I call influencer marketing. He's 
He's calling them opinion leaders. Some people call them KOLs, key opinion leaders. Um, hardcore users are going to be like the people who likely talk about your product a lot or have the deepest understanding of it. These could be current customers. So I would say when you have a limited budget or when the math, when the customer acquisition cost doesn't justify you advertising directly to customers, what you should do is advertise to the influencers. And where do you find them? I've talked about it a lot. You find them on SparkToro. You can find them on their Amazon authors, their YouTubers. They're the admins for Facebook groups. And, you know, it's people that talk about, I don't know, product management, whatever. These are employees at, at companies that you can target, like very influential companies. This is an intelligent, very good way of focusing your advertising. You target the influencers with the ads, and then the influencers through word of mouth will spread it out to the end consumers. Okay, so let's look at some of the data that he's analyzing, some of the research to see what kind of the ideal frequency may be. And then you can play with this to figure out what might work with your situation. So he's also citing some Facebook research. We can see here Facebook research indicated one to two exposures per week over 10 weeks is an ideal average for packaged goods. Okay, we can have that as a baseline. For TV, an emotional connection is created after one or two viewings, a reasoned cognitive response after three to 10 times, and a deeper emotional connection after 10 viewings. So uh, we're looking at around 10 exposures. Uh, if you want to be safe, maybe you want to go with 12. Many subscribe to the rule of seven in order to fully resonate with the target audience. Now, I, I was talking to a colleague who did some very sophisticated business-to-business -business customer acquisition campaigns, and uh, what he found was the frequency of six for the length, the flight of the campaign, was uh, the idea for customer acquisition. Uh, but in, in either of those cases, you're looking at over five. The frequency of three for radio spots uh, for effective recall has been touted. Uh, how do we determine the optimal mix of reach versus frequency? Five to nine exposures are deemed to be the optimal level for driving brand awareness, and 10 plus exposures are deemed the most optimal level for driving purchase intent. So if we kind of combine these two conclusions, we're looking at a frequency of over 10. So when you're thinking about your budgeting for your brand awareness campaigns, you, you uh, may want to figure out the cheapest way to be able to get uh, 11 exposures or more. The advertising rating service Nielsen. So I, I've used Nielsen to look at uh, brand, to track brand awareness and purchase intent. Um, I remember one problem I ran into is that the brand awareness was great, purchase intent was low. Um, so I had to kind of scour social media just to figure out what that was and implement a plan to do it. Uh, sometimes there's a disconnect there. And it's not always just about ramping up the frequency or the reach, often it's changing what the message is and figuring out why people are resistant to buying your product. Uh, so the study in 2017 found that digital ads need between five to nine exposures to improve branding and increase consumer acceptance. So it sounds like around 10 is kind of what the ideal to strive for here is. Okay, so other frequency insights. Media usage habits have logical frequency implications. Um, you need to account for cross-platform measurement. Now, if you're if you're just an early startup, this might be a little too sophisticated for you. But if you're running LinkedIn ads and you're running Facebook ads, and let's say you've imported a list of target customers into both, then um, you can kind of double the frequency, right? If you're getting a frequency of two on LinkedIn and a frequency of two on Facebook, then you have a frequency of four, uh, essentially. He's also highlighting that wear outs is a problem. So people are constantly being exposed to the same thing. Now, I would, I would say that for most companies, I wouldn't be so concerned with wear out. And there's a lot of argument that uh, if you if you have an ad that works, why not just keep running it? Uh, you know, I, I think may, maybe people are a little bit too scared of wear out and they think, oh, we need to refresh the creative. I think what you need, you need a collection of creatives if you're planning to have a, a reasonable frequency in your campaigns and just sort of cycle those through. But I, I would say most, most companies don't focus enough on frequency. They think, oh, we're just going to hit them with one ad. If they didn't click it, then it's a failure. Uh, that, that, that's not the way to think when you're doing brand awareness. It's more like, uh, running video ads uh, repeatedly and exposing them weekly uh, to that ad. 
Now, there are there are people that advocate for just focusing on reach, so a frequency of one, for example, for the entire campaign. And this may work when you're dealing with, okay, we have a fixed budget to create shock and awe in one spot, you know, maybe a Super Bowl ad or something. But I would say it's uh, it's risky. Okay, so the other thing I just want to call out from this article is that with brand marketing, you're often aiming for emotions. Um, they're, even with business to business, this is true. And part of that has to do with brand awareness. You're kind of trying to embed yourself in the long-term memory of people. And that tends to be done at the emotional level, whereas short-term decisions, direct response decisions, sometimes are a bit more rational. Like, am I going to get some sort of immediate logical benefit from clicking this? Okay, I'm going to click it. But when you're going for that long-term play, uh, having that emotional connection can work. And um, there, there are arguments on both sides in terms of generating word of mouth, whether focusing on like functional benefits versus uh, an emotional message resonates more. Uh, and that's something you can experiment with. I've talked before about how business to business marketers in particular do not pay enough attention to frequency. And I would say that perhaps novice or intermediate business to consumer marketers are in a similar position when they're doing advertising. Frequency is one of the most important variables. <clears throat> and in the, the business to business space, uh, it's particularly understated because there's a heavy bias towards any type of advertising that is direct response. And it's under the pseudonym that they call lead generation. But really, really when marketers talk about lead generation, they're not really generating leads. Often what they're doing is just capturing contact information. And there are far more efficient ways to capture contact information that don't require advertising and promoting things like white papers and gated content. You can just go and buy a list. So I would say that as you start to get more advanced, you should be focusing more on frequency as a very important variable in terms of actually changing people's minds psychologically and in terms of actually being able to create brand awareness uh, and, and increase the perceptions of your brand. So let's talk a little bit about this research from Facebook, which uh, did this uh, extensive meta-analysis. And what they did was they looked at uh, brand marketers, the companies that are doing brand marketing, and they looked at campaigns where they're running uh, both image ads or banner ads and uh, also just running video ads. And video ads tends to be kind of uh, the standard for brand awareness. And when we look at this graph here, we can see the impact on uh, the cumulative brand lift in terms of the ad recall, which is this green um, graph, and then the purchase intent. Now, when you do like a brand awareness campaign, you don't necessarily want to increase purchase intent. Now, when I did brand marketing campaigns, I wanted to increase awareness and I wanted to increase purchase intent. The reason being that uh, certain types of products that I was marketing, like video games, for example, you you get a surge of purchases as soon as the product's release. It'd be the same thing with like movies, for example, any, any sort of entertainment product. Most of your sales or a good chunk of your sales are going to happen immediately when the product's launched. So purchase intent and brand awareness are closely aligned. Now, if you're doing business to business brand marketing, somebody's not going to have any purchase intent until the company's at the point where they actually need to, uh, you know, buy new enterprise software, for example. So they might be locked into a five-year con, or I guess five years is pretty long. Let's say a two-year contract, and they're they're not even going to consider replacing whatever they have until that two years is up. Or they might be doing their annual budgeting in uh, I don't know Q3. So. The per it's impossible to affect purchase intent because it's out of your control. And this is something that business-to-business -business brand marketers need to recognize is that there are a lot of variables that are out of your control. But brand awareness, on the other hand, or ad recall, much more controllable than purchase intent because purchase intent is a function of other variables, like I just mentioned. So what, I, what I'm particularly interested in here is the ad recall graph. But you can see that they're, they're both closely aligned. And uh, what we see is there's kind of diminishing returns around, uh, let's say, around here. So around one. 
and then the the returns really start to diminish at a frequency of two so what we're talking about here is people that are exposed to your message twice a week once a week three times a week so you can see that the difference between twice a week and three three times a week is is marginal so it, it appears that kind of the sweet spot uh, if you had to choose one it would be around two because any any marginal increase after that after two a frequency of two per week is uh, there's not much of a payoff there now you could argue that uh, you know 1.5 or 1 is enough uh, because you're still approaching around 80 percent brand lift and that that might be all that you need and the other factor you need to consider is uh, with your brand awareness are you running it continuously or are you running it like in intervals or intermittently so so for example if your product is seasonal then it makes sense to increase the brand awareness at critical time so leading up to like boxing day in november or around amazon prime day something like that because that, that that's where you're going to get maybe 25 per percent of your sales during the holidays now if you're doing like general business to business brand awareness just to kind of increase brand perception then maybe kind of a slow continuous let's just do a frequency of one per week might make more sense for you uh, there's, there's no kind of magic science here you, you need to play around and decide what's optimal for you uh, so this is a meta-analysis looking at 11 uh, brand campaigns and you can see here uh, a frequency cap of one per week was able to capture 80% of the total potential brand lift and ad recall. So that, that's pretty nice, just being able to expose somebody to your message once per, per week. But then when you get to two, you get 95% of the total brand lift. So if, you're, if your target customer group is quite small, that could be significant to go from 80% to 95%. Now, if it's, if it's, if it's a very large group, then uh, it, it may not have as much of an impact. Now, um, I, I, I can't overstate the fact that frequency matters. So there's kind of, I think there's this shift that's happened in marketing. So it used to be marketing was about running these big TV ads, um, and cinema ads and stuff like that. And I, I, I've done some of that myself, but sort of the shift happened when digital marketing took over and people started thinking, if nobody responds to the ad, if they don't buy right away, then the ad was a failure but that, that's that's not the truth because you're you need to understand that marketing is really about persuasion it's about psychology and one thing that you need to do is you need to increase familiarity because familiarity is a driver of liking and liking is a driver of influence and persuasion so people are more likely to go with your brand because they see it more frequently they're more likely to like your brand because they see it more frequently and they're more likely to recall your brand because they see it more frequently and we see that here in two key metrics when it comes to um, brand marketing the ad recall and the purchase intent there is an important point that's related to this idea of frequency that i want to highlight and that is that a lot of business to business marketers make assumptions about the ad recall brand recall and just overall recall of content that prospects have consumed and nowhere is this more important arguably than with LinkedIn so for example when you are running Google Ads you're generally targeting people that are actively looking for solutions so they're they're in that mindset they're searching purposely so they're more likely to remember what they did with Google Ads. Now, a lot of the times that not that's not the case. Okay, I've I've run, I've had to help companies where people would request demos from Google searches and then they, they forgot that they did because they they requested it from multiple companies, so they they don't remember your brand, they don't even remember doing um, the request. But generally, they're more likely to remember an action that they took and to recall things when they did with Google Ads and with LinkedIn because with LinkedIn what you're doing is more outbound marketing so people are just on LinkedIn doing whatever they're doing searching for jobs posting stuff reading things and then you're kind of interrupting them with this advertisement it's like hey we have this cool product why don't you sign up for a free trial and then they sign up for a free trial because there's an easy lead gen form and then they forget about it 
So what we find is that the lead gen forms on LinkedIn, the same thing on Facebook, vastly improve the conversion rates. So more people convert. But the people that convert, there's, there's also a high probability those people aren't going to remember doing it. They're not going to remember your brand name. So there are a few things you need to consider. The first thing is you need to prepare the sales team and the automated emails to nurture people after they respond. Okay. So for example, after they request a demo or sales conversation through a LinkedIn ad, you need to have like an, you should have the follow up message with LinkedIn forms allows you to do to uh, send them to a blog post that educates them more or sends them to a Calendly link to actually schedule. And then when they schedule, you should have automated emails that keep reminding them, here are the benefits of showing up to the demo. Here's what you're going to get. By the way, here's a three minute video uh, testimonial from one of our prospects, one of our customers and how successful they were. So uh, there's that ongoing marketing. There's also the retargeting. So retargeting people. Uh, and you can do this on LinkedIn with retargeting groups of people that requested a sales conversation, a demo, whatever it is that you're promoting, a quote request, etc. Okay, so there's that ongoing nurturing that's important because people are not going to remember a lot. The other important thing is that in general, it just takes a lot of repetition for people to remember things. I remember when I was living in Indonesia, there was a, a language barrier, uh, but there was also a cultural barrier in communication where uh, people would... And, and this happens even between people that speak Indonesian to each other, is that you'll say what, what you want when you make an order, uh, but they just don't really, it doesn't sink in what you've said. The, the, the conscientious expectation is not very high. So you uh, often people will get what they don't ask for in Indonesia. So what, you, what I noticed in their culture was there's lots of repetition. There's constant confirmations that are required uh, in applications, for example. When you, when you order their equivalent of Uber, uh, you always have to confirm uh, the pickup point. You always have to confirm that uh, you're actually receiving the ride. Tons of, tons of confirmations, tons of repetition. And that's something that you may need to do with LinkedIn. And what that may mean is that the ideal frequency is not one. It may be seven. And it may be 10, it may be five. Uh, you need to not make assumptions that because somebody watched 25% of your video, they actually recall any of it. Or because they clicked your ad that they remember your brand name. They, they're not going to remember your brand name, probably. What they're going to remember is whatever valuable piece of information you provided about the problem that you talked about. So when we're doing awareness marketing on LinkedIn, often the focus is not, do they remember our name? Do they recall our name? It's, are they more educated because of the ad that we ran? And what's the level of frequency, repetition, variety of media that we need to use to hit people to get them to the point where they do actually recall the information, where it's actually sinking into their mind? And this is, this is where advanced marketing becomes much more about psychology, persuasion, nurturing. An amateur business to business marketer is just fixated on one thing, and that is direct responses. Did the person respond or not? That's not what an advanced LinkedIn advertiser will do. An advanced LinkedIn advertiser is thinking, how do I persuade somebody to go from here to here, to go from I have a vague idea of what my problem is or what I need to, oh, I'm actually kind of interested in buying this product. I think I'm going to talk to a salesperson. And that's psychology, that's repetition, that's persuasion, that's getting the right frequency, that's getting the right mix of advertisements. And that's ultimately how you're going to change the mindset of the people, the mindset that you are the solution to their problem that your product category is the solution to their problem, that talking to sales is the solution to their problem, and that's going to require repetition because people are obsessed with themselves. Business-to-business -business marketers are obsessed with their own company. So you're thinking about your product every day. You're thinking about your ads every day. You're thinking about your blog posts. But 
when somebody actually clicks through to your blog post, whether it's through a LinkedIn ad or through an email, whatever, they they may not even remember the title, let alone anything else that's in that article. You might need to deliver that message through a blog post. You might need to deliver it through a video. You might need to deliver it through a video three times before it sinks in. And there's no there's no science to this. It's it's a it's a mix of psychology, creativity, and science to kind of figure out what's the what's the degree of repetition that's needed to persuade somebody to take action. And that's gonna require qualitative research, quantitative research, and lots of LinkedIn testing. There's a critical thing that you need to understand about brand marketing. And that is that the way you measure the success and the approach that you take with brand marketing is fundamentally different from the approach that you take with performance marketing in the business to consumer space and demand generation in the business to business space. So often what happens is companies are very successful in the early and mid stages because they focus on the income statement. They focus on revenue. And the way that you do that is by doing things like direct response types of marketing. And that's what I advocate in a number of my courses, for example, my course on startup marketing. So it's very proven, it's excellent. The problem is that people become endowed with this idea of direct response marketing and they believe that because it was what was successful in the past, it's what will be successful in the future. But that's not true. There's an inflection point. And that inflection point may be, say, $5 million in revenue where you need to start investing in a very different type of marketing. So let's talk about what those differences are. The first difference is that when you're doing performance type marketing, you're looking at generating results maybe in six months or less. So you're looking at about two quarters. When you're doing brand marketing, the impact that you're, is being realized is more on the after six months, after one year, but that's where the payoff really is. Now doing brand marketing is going to help in the short term. It's going to help things like demand generation, it's going to build aware, uh, awareness, etc. But the real impact is going to be those people that are not necessarily shopping for your category of product or service right now, but they will be in the future. So it's not going to be uh, immediately measurable hard metrics, things like pipeline revenue and sales. So what you need to start looking at is very different types of KPIs. And those KPIs are going to be th things like how famous your brand is, uh, which is basically an extreme form of brand awareness that people immediately think of you uh, when there's a buying need. From the execution standpoint, what that means is that you need to focus more on emotional types of marketing because that's how you become memorable. It also means being more bold. So the success in the past is often focused on very rational things, right? scarcity. If I don't act now, there's a fear of missing out, so I better redeem that coupon. Or in business to business, it's something like if I uh, sign up for this webinar now, I'm going to get all this useful information that I won't be able to sign up later. Now that, that's very uh, logical types of thinking, and that, that's perfectly fine when you're trying to capture demand. But when you're actually trying to generate demand in the long term, you need to get into people's emotional centers. So that means the messaging requires a fundamental shift. So if you are marketing your brand marketing services, or if you're trying to advocate for brand marketing internally, you need to set the expectation with your team, with your client, with the company, that there is a fundamental difference in how we're going to approach marketing moving forward with the brand. Where I've seen this gone poorly is when a company is very, very successful with direct response, performance style marketing, they try to dip their toes into brand awareness marketing, but the way they measure success of brand awareness and the channels that they use are aligned with the same KPIs that they were using uh, in the performance marketing front. So that just doesn't work because you can't try to do a brand awareness campaign, but measure it by the same barometer of short-term uh, pipeline revenue or acquire customers the way that you would when you're running different types of things like an outbound cold email, let's secure some meetings, uh, that, types of, that type of campaign. Uh, so you really need to get buy-in with the idea that long-term brand awareness is actually a meaningful KPI to pursue.
So let's take a look at a campaign where the objective is not necessarily just getting those immediate quick wins, those fast results, more interested in kind of broader market awareness, brand recognition, brand recall. So with this campaign, we're looking at a total number of impressions of over a million, and we're focused on pushing things like video views and image views that help position the brand appropriately. So if we take a look, closer look at this, you can see an ad promoting Takatu to veterinarians, and we can see that there's a nice high production advertisement here that tells a story uh, that's kind of focused on uh, a, a, a bit of humor, a bit of emotion, kind of a more consumer type of marketing. And that's what you do with brand marketing. It's more consumer-like. And uh, we have a high engagement with this, right? 246 comments, 92 shares. Now, is that the kind of viral thing you typically get with direct response business to business marketing? No, but it is something you can get when you focus on more uh, brand-centric entertaining types of advertising which is what you're doing when you're aiming for brand fame and you're not aiming for uh, kind of quick win sign up now. Okay, so when a video is an example of that, but you can also run things like image ads. So for example, uh, this image ad had 12,000, a reach of 12,000. This had a, uh, a reach of 300,000. And we're looking at a, a frequency of around two uh, on average here. So let's take a look at this. Uh, Takatu is making vet clinics more efficient. And the 200, 2021 winner VMX uh, pet pitch competition. Okay, so it's not like, hey, uh, get 15% off by signing up now. It's positioning the brand and uh, highlighting what, linking the brand to what it's able, what the company delivers, which is more efficiency. So a little more of a practical focus, perhaps, getting into a little more of the details about uh, product evaluation and helping to meet people that are maybe uh, not extremely top of funnel, but perhaps still a little bit in the, the top of funnel, mid, mid funnel stage. And then if people want to, they can click to learn more. But again, we're not pushing the offer super aggressively with this type of advertising. Uh, it, it's helping to secure mind share in people. Now, if we wanted to evaluate the performance at a granular level, what we could do is we could go into the ad sets column and take a look here at some of the metrics that we want to see. So we could highlight performance, setup, delivery to see, you know, who we're reaching, engagement, video engagement specifically, app engagement, engagement, performance and clicks, cross device. So, you know, are people checking on mobile? Uh, are they checking on desktop? Targeting, creative, bidding and optimization, messaging, engagement. Now, one of the things I want to call out here is the customization option. So you can look at whatever KPIs you were most interested in. Is it going to be delivery? Is it attribution setting? Results? Reach? Frequency? Reach and frequency, two of the most important things you need to pay attention to when you're, you're thinking high level advertising and not just sort of quick win uh, direct response advertising. Yeah, you can look at demographic information, engagement rank, cost per click, probably less important when you're, when you're running something like a video campaign to create awareness, but uh, still something that you might want to factor in. So I talked about various types of metrics that you want to track when you're focused more on awareness, less on direct response. We're looking at reach, we're looking at frequency. And uh, one of the key ones that Facebook provides us is the, the recall. So we have estimated uh, recall lift for people, the estimated ad recall lift rate, and the cost per estimated ad recall. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to check all of these off as filters, and we're going to take a look at how they performed. So now that I've added these more brand-centric measures of performance into the columns, I'm able to see uh, for the relevant campaigns how they perform. Now, normally, when you're doing something like Google Ads or Facebook Ads, LinkedIn Ads, you're often looking at things like kick click-through rate and CPC, so $2, $2, $2. But really, what we're more interested in is the long-term leading indicators, which are going to be things like estimated ad recall lift. And we can see here that uh, for this brand awareness campaign and this video uh, campaign as well, we're getting a lift of 7,200. Here it's about 4,400. And here it's about 1,100. This is a campaign specific for Australia. So the estimated ad recall lift rate is 19% for this campaign, and only about 10% here and about 3% here. So we can see that the the percentage increase is actually the highest for this particular campaign. But look at the cost. 
cost was substantially higher. Where we're getting the more efficient outcome without a lot of sacrifice in terms of absolute terms is in the videos campaign. So this is consistent with my experience. I, when I would run very aggressive brand awareness campaigns, I would do so using television, using videos and cinemas, things like that. And that's where you really get the skyrocket in performance. So a lot of people think, oh, okay, well, we'll do cost per impression, we'll run a bunch of banner ads, but where are you actually getting the brand recall? Often that's going to come from the videos, and that's definitely what we're seeing here. Now let's take a closer look at what exactly this KPI means. So est cost per estimated ad recall lift people. The average cost for each estimated ad recall lift, this metric is only available for assets in the brand awareness, post engagement, and video views objectives. How it's calculated. The metric is calculated as total amount spent divided by estimated ad recall lift rate, people. So we can see that the, the first variable uh, that we're going to dive closer in here that is a component of this is the estimated ad recall lift. So estimated ad recall lift is an estimate of the number of additional people who may remember seeing your ads if asked within two days. So it's ad recall within two days. Now that's not exactly what we're optimizing for with B2B brand awareness. Usually we want to see, are you going to be famous in six, six months or beyond? But uh, at least Facebook gives us something we can work with that isn't just simply cost per impression. I've been talking a lot about advertising because advertising is one of the easiest, fastest levers that you can pull when you're trying to raise brand awareness. But the other approach that I've recommended over and over to people is influencer marketing because it can be one of the easiest ways to generate tons of awareness. And the great thing about influencer marketing is that when you're able to focus your outbound messaging on a small group of people, the people that are most influential, then you're able to actually disseminate the message to a much, much wider group. So it's an incredibly efficient tool that you can use to do brand marketing. So, for example, with this campaign that I managed globally, uh, you can see that one of the biggest influencers in the world was able to pick up a product that I was marketing, and we got about 15 million views just from a single video. And this is an incredibly efficient approach to marketing that I think more people, both in consumer and business to business, should prioritize. So what exactly is a brand manager? What is brand management? And there's a lot of confusion here. The reason being that companies in different industries and companies of different sizes are going to define this very, very differently. Now, one thing that I don't like in the marketing world is a lot of people think the brand is everything. Like when you're talking about strategic marketing, you're really talking about the brand. I don't think that's actually true. I think your brand is one asset that you can leverage to enhance your marketing plan, to enhance your marketing strategy. But it's not the only one, and it, it's not always the most important one. Now, in certain circumstances, it is arguably the most important one. So for example, with certain luxury products, your brand's incredibly important. But when we're talking about things like business to business tech products, your brand may actually be a secondary consideration, an important one, but not as important perhaps as the functional use cases that the product produces. So let's talk about these different contexts. Now, the most prototypical example of where we hear the word brand manager is in the CPG or FMCG industry. So these are uh, consumer packaged goods and in some parts of the world, world they're called fast moving consumer goods. But herein lies the biggest source of confusion. A brand manager in the CPC industry is not really a brand manager. Their primary role is actually a product manager. They are managing the product. And not only are they managing the product, they're managing the profit and loss on that product. Now, where it gets confusing is that a brand manager in the CPG industry is actually a hybrid role where they're not just the product manager, they're also the product marketing manager. So they're not just handling the what the product features are, the development of the product, but they're also handling the marketing strategy in terms of which markets they're going to penetrate, what they're going to highlight, what the positioning is going to be, etc. And then in a third sense, the brand manager is actually a true brand manager in the sense that they are managing the brand as a marketing asset in conjunction uh, with other marketing assets that could be things like 
uh, you know, what kind of communications channels are we using, etc. So a brand manager in the CPG space is much more than a brand manager. They're a true general manager, a true product manager. One component of what they do is true brand management, managing the brand identity, the design, the logo, the brand associations, as well as the, the, the brand marketing. So things like awareness campaigns, uh, as opposed to just sort of direct response, non-brand marketing campaigns. So that, that's the typical case that people think of with brand manager. Now, when we get into, for example, the tech space, and I'm, I'm thinking here about large tech companies, uh, we have roles that might be called brand manager or they might be called brand marketing manager. And what these people do is they're separate from product marketing managers. So product marketing managers are handling the marketing strategy for specific products or specific features in the tech industry. And then often what there are is there are separate people who manage the overarching brand. So for example, uh, the Google brand, the Google identity is going to be spread across multiple different brands like Google Maps. It's going to be managed for uh, Google search. It's going to be managed for the business to business Google, the business consumer Google. So somebody needs to think about, okay, what what are the different terms we're using for our sub brands? What are the colors that we're using? Are we doing advertising campaigns to promote the Google name at large instead of just specific products or specific features and use cases? And that's where the brand manager or the brand marketing manager plays a role. It's kind of the, the overarching messaging rather than just sort of the specific uh, marketing plans for specific products. So typically you see that kind of brand manager in companies that are fairly large because when you're when you're a small company or when you're a mid-sized company, brand marketing isn't really that important, particularly in, in the business to business space. So you start to see this unfold more with enterprise companies. Now, the other example I want to talk about is when we're talking about a product marketing manager in a mid-sized company. So here you have the product the person is serving the product marketing manager function, which is uh, basically the strategic aspect of marketing, figuring out uh, which target markets you're participating in, how you create value in those markets, etc. Now, the other role that they sometimes play is as a brand manager. And the reason that they're playing the blame, the brand manager position is because there is no justification for having a dedicated role for brand management when you're a mid-sized company or even a small company. So what they will do is they are the de facto brand manager. They're managing the messaging, the positioning, the uh, perhaps some of the changes that are happening to the identity and the logo. So they're kind of piecing together uh, what that marketing looks like. Now, there is no really brand marketing management happening. Like there's no brand awareness campaigns. Generally speaking, we're not doing multi-million dollar TV campaigns when you're in a smaller, medium-sized company. That starts to unfold uh, when you're in these larger companies. But the other role that the product marketing manager plays is just sort of as a general marketing director. So they're they're basically coordinating all the different marketing. So the direct response marketing, any brand marketing or brand messaging that's happening, uh, the digital marketing, uh, the, the growth marketing, they're kind of the, the hub uh, of the marketing. And in that sense, they're they're also the hub for any any brand assets that are coming through. Marketing. The first thing that comes to mind when I say that word for many people is the four P's. The four P's are legendary. Even people that aren't in marketing know about the four P's. But what most people don't realize is that the original marketing mix didn't consist of the four P's. It consisted of 12 elements. So this is the marketing mix. The marketing mix is like a recipe a mixture that you would use to bake a cake. But in this case, it's a mixture that you use to create a marketing initiative. But the four P's stuck with us. Today, we even have a more superior framework called the seven T's. The seven T's are less confusing. The seven T's are more relevant today. 
and the seven T's are more comprehensive. But still in the corporate world, people use the four P's. Why is that? It's because of radical simplification. People remember things that are simple, and simple things are stickier. There's another example in the corporate world. Myers-Briggs personality test. You've probably done this before. It's a test that's used to determine what your personality is. Now, the Myers-Briggs personality test might be something like, I am an ENTP, I am an introvert, I am one of these five elements. But in psychology, we have a vastly more superior personality framework, the big five personality traits. It's more statistically robust, it's more universal across cultures, and it's much more strongly supported by the academic community, and it's been around for decades. So why do people stick to the Myers-Briggs framework? It's because it's simple. All you need to do is identify that one personality type that you are. For example, ENTP. I am an ENTP. My coworker is ISTJ. And it's very simple to have a conversation when you're dealing with one element rather than the big five personality framework in which you have to look at five different components. It's not just a single label that you apply to yourself. It's five different labels. That's too complicated for people to remember. Things are sticky when they're memorable and when they're simple. There is a very important distinction that we need to make between small and large companies when it comes to marketing because it has a huge impact on the way that you approach branding and brand management. Now, the first thing that I wanna do is take a look at investing. So if we look at investing from a value investor's perspective, so we're looking at uh, like Bruce Greenwald of Columbia Business School, we're looking at Warren Buffett, we're looking at some of the most credible uh, people in terms of valuing companies. The way that they value companies is fundamentally starting with the assets of the company. That's where the, the bulk of the value is. And then second to that is the revenue or the earnings power, the earnings potential that that company has. And that's the, the essentially the profit that's coming in. And then the, the third element is the growth. Is, is there potential for this company to grow? Now, I'm talking in, in generalities here. So, for example, when I mention revenue, you, you may think of that as profit. When, when I talk about assets, you may think of uh, the book values, the assets min minus the liabilities. But I'm just sort of talking at a high level that we're talking about assets, we're talking about revenue, and then we're looking at the growth potential of, of those things. So when you're in a small company, really what you need to be focused on is revenue management. And for this reason, often what you see with a lot of marketers that have experience with small and mid-sized businesses is they think that um, certain types of marketing are better. And often that's direct response marketing. So the kind of marketing that is designed to generate sales immediately, sort of that infomercial style of, of marketing your brand. Um, and, and this makes sense. When you're a small business, you need to be focused on short-term revenue because you don't even know if your company is going to be alive in a year. You don't know if you're going to have enough funding to sustain your stuff for the next two quarters. So you need to think in terms of short-term results, low-hanging fruit, bottom-of-funnel performance, all about getting cash. So what that means is that small businesses need to be focused on the income statement, which is where you find uh, the revenue and the profit, and less focused on uh, the assets. So what that means is that the priority in your marketing in small businesses is, uh, in business to consumer, it's called performance marketing. So it's things like PPC ads that are designed to generate sales immediately. And uh, in business to business, typically we would call this demand generation. So uh, generating leads and then nurturing those leads to uh, be ready to have conversations with the sales team so that the sales team can, can close the deal and generate revenue. So all the focus here is on basically short-term performance. And it shows up on the income statement in the form of revenue. 
Now, there's a fundamental shift that happens when you're trying to be a large company or when you already are a large company, because now the focus is not on revenue management, it's on asset management. The reason it's on asset management is because assets are how you get long-term results in terms of economies of scale. Assets are also where the value starts to come from in your company because you've, you've built up revenue over time, you've built up a reputation, you've built up a brand, so suddenly you have something worth protecting, uh, worth managing. So these are going to show up in the balance sheet. The balance sheet is fundamentally where your, your brand lives, if the brand has any sort of uh, brand equity. So equity is another term that we associate with assets and with the balance sheet. So as you get larger, what becomes less important is do we advertise on Google? Do we send out direct mail? Instead, it's more own channels. So we have a lot of followers on our Facebook page. We have a lot of followers on LinkedIn. We have people that uh, are advocates for our brand. We have communities. We have events that we own, like we do the annual event in our industry. So managing these things we already own and extracting as much value as possible out of those becomes the priority when you're large. When you're small, you can't do that because it just takes too much time to build up those types of things. The other focus that happens when you're large is you're more thinking in terms of investments that produce long-term growth uh, rather than just how do I generate an extra percentage of revenue this month. At least that's where the focus should be. Now, often what happens is we see the opposite. Small companies try focus too much on, on uh, assets, so things like building the brand. The large companies focus too much on demand generation performance marketing when really they should be thinking about the long-term equity being established in the brand itself. Now, there, there's a key exception I need to highlight here. So if you are in a small company, <clears throat> but you're in a category where the brand is utterly important, in other words, the value that's created by whatever you're selling is, say, over 50% coming from the brand and only maybe less than 50% coming from the product itself, then you have to be focused on brands when you're small. Now, I would say that's the exception, not the rule, but if we're thinking about something like the luxury space or certain consumer commodities, brands become utterly, utterly important, so you have to invest in them early. Now, generally speaking, though, so for example, in the business-to-business -business space, uh, you're not going to be focused much on brands at all in the early stages, except kind of the bare minimum. Let's have a nice logo. Let's, you know, have some sort of identity or some sort of name to associate our products and services with. Uh, but the, it, generally speaking, your, your brand awareness doesn't, uh, really factor in your, um, your brand logo doesn't really matter in those early stages. But later on, it's going to be critical. So the brand marketing uh, becomes critical later on because in the business to business space, people just want to go with whatever the default choice is. And the default choice, uh, the easy choice, the conservative choice, the low risk choice is going to be a brand that people recognize. So focusing on brand awareness as you get larger becomes more and more important. But when you're small, you just don't have the funds to do that. But as I mentioned, in some cases, uh, even even if you're not focused on brand awareness type of marketing, you do have to be focused strategically on how the brand creates value, even if it's not widely known. So uh, the, the intangible psychological value that comes from the brand. I want to highlight one of the most critical errors that brand managers make, and it's at the positioning level. Now, if you don't know what positioning is, Generally, it is the position that your brand holds in the minds of the target customers. And usually what that involves in the practical sense is what you choose to emphasize in your marketing communications. For example, you can emphasize a particular benefit, a few different benefits. Uh, you can emphasize any sort of product attribute that you want to. You could emphasize a particular feature, a feeling, different types of things. Now, the problem, the mistake that a lot of brand managers make is by default, they assume that higher level benefits matter more. 
And high-level benefits in the consumer space tends to be very emotional things, like helping your self-esteem, your freedom, your liberation, your feeling of contentment. And then in the business-to-business -business space, usually high-level benefits are more around profit. So it's going to be adding more to your profit, or in some cases, perhaps reducing your expenses or increasing your revenue. But what we see in the research is that often the most effective positioning is lower level. It's more about the features. It's more about the function. It's more about functional use cases, less about high level emotional uh, benefits, the, the ones that resonate the most with the target customer. So I'm going to read this quotation from McKinsey and Company. It says, marketers tend to build campaigns around emotional positioning. Yet we found that consumers actually tend to talk and generate buzz about functional messages. So what this is saying is that when you're trying to generate word of mouth, if you position your brand advertising, your brand creative around like a feature or like a very durable handle, for example, on your backpack or something like that, that's more likely to generate word of mouth, according to McKinsey, uh, then if you talked about, oh, this, this makes me feel like I'm, I'm such a liberal explorer of the world, or, you know, whatever that backpack might be used for. The other important thing to highlight here is that McKinsey and Company is saying that even with products like cosmetics, where you would think that the emotions matter the most, right? We're talking about beauty. We're talking about self-esteem. We're talking about feeling better about yourself, loving yourself. You would think that emotional positioning is more effective there. But here McKinsey is saying that even in those cases, in those extreme cases where you think emotional positioning is best, it's not. And it's better to go with functional position. Now, I'm not saying this is universal. I, I'm not saying you should always do this. I just want you to be aware of this inherent bias that brand managers have where they think, they feel almost obligated to position themselves around something higher when really you can meet customers with more empathy by talking about functional lower level benefits. What I'm going to do now is analyze some ads and posts that I saw on social media, primarily on LinkedIn. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at them from a brand marketing versus direct response marketing angle. Now, the intention of this lecture is not to stimulate the debate about which is better. Direct response is appropriate in some cases. Brand marketing is appropriate in other cases. Uh, the purpose is to analyze the effectiveness of the ads in terms of whether they're trying to position and expand the brand or whether they're trying to get a direct response out of the ad, both of which are completely legitimate uh, purposes. So we have here this post uh, from Matthew Sweezy, who's uh, very much a, a thought leader in the business-to-business -business marketing space from Salesforce. All right, so he posted this ad and he said 160x of the regular brand engagement. So he's saying the ad was very effective. And what do we have here? Fast ad of the week award goes to Oscar Meyer Foods with this gem. Call us next time you want to ride a wiener into space. And then they have this uh, Oscar Meyer wiener car exploding into space like a rocket ship, which is kind of a funny thing. We have over 8,000 retweets, about 3,000 quote tweets, 34,000 likes uh, on this ad through through the Twitter sphere. So <clears throat> now, when when a direct response marketer looks at something like this, they're like, "Yeah, who cares, right? They're, nobody's buying my Oscar Mayer coupon because of this ad. They're not they're not doing anything. Uh, but what it's doing is it's creating uh, brand awareness, it's creating um, reverberation. And that's one of the main things that we want when we do creative marketing like this is it's not the direct impact of what happens when somebody sees the ad. It's the cascade effect you get from we retweets, shares, etc. because you're getting tons of publicity. So uh, in your mind is hot dogs, Oscar Mayer. Uh, and part of the reason that it goes viral is because it's funny and it's, it's making fun of uh, these tech CEOs that are, uh, are going into space. So humor is an effective vehicle for brand marketing, even though it may not be appropriate or sensible in direct response marketing. So 
uh, here is somebody who helps people make high performing courses. So I'm, I'm seeing a lot of these in my feed. And uh, here's a, a picture of her face. And she has a, a very excellent copywriting to promote her webinar, which is three steps to scale your experience into a six figure online course without paid ads hosted by Sunny. Now, uh, I, I think this is great. I think the copywriting is amazing. It's addressing objections. So my first objection might be, hey, I'm going to have to pay for ads. No, you don't have to pay for ads. It's very specific. Three steps. It's not just some vague uh, how to scale your experience. It's the exact three steps you need to know. And there's this specific promise of a six figure online course. So all of what she's done here is an effective direct response advertisement. Very specific offer promises, um, you know, all you need to do is sign up to get a response from this. Now, subtly, there's some branding here, right? She's using some, uh, clearly she has some sort of style guide here with the gold and the white. She has her face, but the primary purpose here is not promoting Sunny, right? It's not about how great Sunny is. In fact, there's very little here talking about Sunny and what her history is. So her personal brand is not the focus here. It's embedded as part of the brand guide and how she promotes herself, but it's not the focus. The focus is on the specific promise, the specific offer. So that's something you need to keep in mind when you're doing brand management is that uh, even when you're doing direct response marketing, there are brand elements, brand consistency needs to be applied even if you're not promoting the brand itself. Okay, so here is a controversial campaign that we're seeing from Tiffany's, or Tiffany, excuse me. So they have these billboards with these models and it says, not your mother's Tiffany. So what they're trying to do, as we can see from this LinkedIn post, is reposition the brand. So uh, as we demonstrated with Lacoste, one of the challenges is that these brands start to take on a reputation of being for old people. Old, boring people, they're not fun, they're not hip, they're not with it. You're, you're not fashionable if you're old. Um, so they're trying to reposition it with these kind of bold, uh, kind of, I would say a little bit of a grungy kind of early 90s angle instead of the, uh, I don't know, maybe preppy or kind of stuck up angle. Now, whether that's strategically sound or not, uh, I'm not sure, but I'm sure what the brand managers are doing is they're looking at their data and they're being like, wow, we really need to capture the affluent segment of people that uh, perhaps are in their 20s and early 30s and, and move a little bit away from the the older positioning in the market that we may have. Okay, now I saw this ad, and this is a hotel uh, that I've stayed at for you know a week on end or whatever. I, I like it, nice hotel, nice service, nice design, decent price, um, and cool advertising. So they're running these ads. I think I saw this one on Facebook. And let's take a look at it from a design perspective, first of all. So we have very consistent brand colors, right? We have this kind of maroonish red. We have this, this blue. We have consistency of the colors in the imagery too. And now we have the brand design. So they've actually created a little sub-brand. And it's, uh, it's almost like a logo, uh, WFH, which normally is work from home. They're saying it's work from hotels. So it's kind of clever, clever gimmick, which is something I do. I work from hotels all the time. Uh, work from hotel at Centara rates from Thai bot 4550 for seven nights, 650 per night. Book now. Centara from hotel. And there's like some champagne glasses cheering. Let us take care of you and take care of your business and your family and then blah, 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 blah. So um, there's two things that are going on here. One is they're doing an excellent job from a brand consistency and applying the design standards. They've also created a little sub-brand for this idea of uh, work from hotel, which is clever. But the primary success of this ad is really not about branding. Yeah, okay, branding's being applied, it's being used, but the primary thing here is the offer. They've basically branded the offer itself, which is this book for seven nights it's a work from hotel um, offering uh, you should take us up on it now i looking at the prices it's not actually a good deal it's cheaper for me just to go to agoda and pay for one night rather than <laughs> spending seven nights through this but i i thought it was very clever um to do this um but but again it, it's mostly focused on the direct response but with an overlay of, of brand consistency um, now if this were 
promoting Centara, the brand, it'd be very different, right? The emphasis would be on the, the brand name, what uh, the brand stands for, why, you know, long term Centara should be your hotel of choice. Uh, but here it's more just like book now. Let's get immediate return on investment off this. Okay, so I saw this post on LinkedIn and I thought it was really interesting, right? So lots of designers, I've worked with tons of designers, I've hired designers in Poland and Ukraine and Canada, all over the place, great, great designers. Um, but one of the challenges is that there's tons of designers out there, right? It's a pretty saturated market. So how do you stand out from that? And if you're talking about your personal brand, uh, I thought this person did an excellent job of it. Uh, he's highlighting, first of all, he's leveraging other brands. And that's a lesson we learned from Lacoste, right? How do you build credibility? You associate with brand, other brands that have credibility, particularly in the space that you want, right? So if Lacoste wants to be hip, it's going to align itself with Bruno Mars. If Lacoste wants to be high status, it's going to align itself with the President of the United States. So what this person's doing is he's leveraging Uber, Udemy, Zoom, uh, it looks like probably Tim Ferriss. So immediately for me, as somebody that's worked in tech for a long time, I'm like, wow, okay, so this guy is the designer of choice uh, in the tech space. So he says, when billions are in the game, somehow this designer is, in, is involved. So basically what he's saying is if, if this is a massive project like for tech unicorns, for companies that have billions of dollars available, he's, he's the uh, designer of choice. Uh, and I thought, I thought it was an excellent case of personal branding. Often when people think about marketing or branding, they think of the go-to-market tactics that persuade a customer to buy a product. Typically, this is presented like a funnel that begins with brand awareness, followed by consideration, and then ends with purchase. More sophisticated variations of this will add in key elements. For example, the customer journey doesn't end with a purchase, since the buyer can become loyal and make repeat purchases. In reality, the decision journey will vary from company to company, and you can do brand research to figure out how people hear about and buy your brand. But there is a general framework that you can use that was developed by McKinsey, one of the top consulting firms. Their research suggests that the funnel metaphor is flawed. In reality, the journey is more circular. Here you can see that in the evaluation stage, people might actually start considering more brands. So the process isn't necessarily a gradual narrowing of which brands to consider. This framework also emphasizes the importance of triggers. You should think about what happens in someone's life that makes them go about to find brands that solve their problem. McKinsey's framework is much more consumer-centric rather than brand-centric. As a general rule, you should start brand research with qualitative methods such as observations, interviews, and focus groups. For one project I worked on, I used Skype interviews to find out how people thought about a new package design concept we had developed. To develop the brand strategy for a video game, I used focus groups. This type of research is where you get insights. You can then use those insights to quantify information using tools like surveys. Throughout brand marketing campaigns, you can assess the market to see how some key performance indicators have changed. Large companies often use Nielsen data to track metrics, such as brand awareness and purchase intent. Nielsen that agency know almost nothing for sure because they cannot measure the results of their advertising. In the advertising world today, there seems to be a bias towards advertising that can be easily measured. People like David Ogilvie are huge proponents of direct response advertising which has become a battle cry for many lead generation digital marketers. These people often distance themselves from so-called brand marketers. I'll explain why this direct marketing ethos 
leads to problems. Some of the things most worth investing in are the least easy to measure. Often the things that can be measured most easily are tactical, superficial, and short term. I would consider branding a mid-term marketing tool. You would typically invest in assets like brands before you invest in demand generation. Not everything can or should be measured. For example, assessing the perception of your brand may involve extensive and time-consuming surveys. You need to consider the return on investment of measuring your marketing. 